you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshock True Crime. You are listening to the Columbine Conspiracy Podcast Series. The most logical, exhaustive, comprehensive examination of the Columbine incident. One of the most infamous cases in history that has left the United States, if not a lot of the world, permanently scarred from this tragic event. But did everything unfold as alleged on the idiot box in the years since, known as the official narrative? Is it true? In this exhaustive, comprehensive analysis, we'll be going over every single eyewitness account, of which there are over 100, that do not match the official narrative. We don't fall for logical fallacies here, so we won't be appealing to authorities or appealing to popularity logical fallacies or false dichotomies. We examine every single theory for veracity in an objective, neutral, and scientific fashion without falling for these logical fallacies. I am, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire, and this is Episode 8, Robert Perry, Part 2. In our previous episode, we went over dozens and dozens of sightings of Robert Perry specifically, and we're not even close to done. Not just Robert Perry, but multiple other shooters, some witnesses who saw them at the same time. Now, maybe they're all hallucinating, maybe they're all wrong, but some of these individuals know all of the parties in questions and had excellent looks at them. Some of them even looked at them for over 30 seconds before any kind of shooting erupted, so there was no fog of war. It was just a normal situation. Some of them even talked to Robert Perry or these other individuals before any shooting, so they know exactly who they saw and what they were wearing. So it's very curious how the coincidence theorists write this all off and do these endless mental gymnastics to justify their blind faith in the corrupt. I am, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire, and we will continue our ongoing examinations. If you enjoy the podcast, find it informative and interesting, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you're allowed advice to have those notifications come through. Like and share this podcast. Let's spread logic and reason to a world where it is quickly going extinct. So like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast requests. You could also be a guest on the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind. Leave them in the comment section. Let's go to Leanne Clark, uh, document 2722-2728. This is her handwritten report, 3.42 p.m. April 20th, day of. I have second hour off about 9 a.m. I was walking to see my friend in jewelry class, and he was walking past the phones. He was tall, about six feet, white, skinny, his hat backwards, he had sunglasses on, black long coat with some kind of a red heart cross thing on it. Black army boots that went up high. So I'm guessing this is not her friend. So she's seeing her friend, but now she's describing the suspect. He was walking past the phone, okay? About six feet tall, white skinny, head on backwards. He had sunglasses on, black long coat with some kind of a red heart cross thing on it. Black army boots that went up high to the knees. Black pants with pockets on the sides. So again, not skinny, skin-tight jeans with no pockets like other people have observed. Chains everywhere on him. And a black backpack. He was walking slowly and looking around slowly. Then, right after fourth period, I was going down to the commons. I had just gotten my pop, and I was, I'm guessing that's soda. And I was standing by the windows, and I heard gunshots. Then I ducked and glass shattered. Then I ran up the stairs, and I still heard gunfire, so I ran through the back doors across from Columbine to Leewood Park. We were standing there for about... 15 minutes when we heard gunfires and saw gunfires, so I ran, and the teachers told us to run. I found my friend John in his car, then I went to my friend Emma, Emma's house, then I called my mom, and she came and picked us up. There is one girl that I have known since third grade. We have been to three schools together. 
Columbine Elementary, Highlands Ranch Christian School, and Denver Christian. We used to be best friends before she started to have mental problems. She is now a Wiccan, devil worshiper. She wears all black, hates the sun, talks about killing all the preps at Columbine. Her name is Courtney Vandell. She is a freshman. I did not see her with them, but I know she associates with them. Supplemental report dated April 26th. Investigator met with Leanne and her mother, Wendy Harder, at their home. Leanne was given an opportunity to review her statement made on the date of the offense, April 20th, after which she stated it was correct. Leanne stated she saw the weird student as she was approaching this jewelry class around 9 a.m. and the person was looking all around while walking slowly down the hallway. The suspicious person was alone and wearing his head on backward. She went on to say he had sunglasses that were plastic and all black with the circular lenses on. An insignia was in the center of a long black coat. The coat was almost knee length. It had pockets on the side and he wore it with a collar raised up in the back. Leanne feels the jacket was open and had buttons close to it instead of a zipper. The suspicious party was carrying a black backpack over his right shoulder. He had metal chains on his hat, backpack, and pants. His black pants were fabric, not jeans, and he had pockets on the side. His boots were black and high, almost to the knee with black shoestrings. Leanne doesn't think she knew him or would be able to identify him if seen again. Okay, some more curious statements here. After this, Leanne went to class. Then afterward, around 11, 10 a.m., after fourth period, she was in the commons area next to the cafeteria. She heard gunshots coming from outside. Then glass on the outside wall started flying. She stated she heard two or three shots at first. She described them as really loud, and they kept coming right after each other. Leanne ran down the hallway and upstairs near the library, and then down the hall by the math hall and outside to Leewood Park, which is next to the teacher's parking lot. Leanne stated she could have sworn someone else was upstairs shooting. She remembers hearing two shots coming from the library area. Leanne remembers seeing someone in black near the pop machines in the common area when the shooting started. She stated she can't describe him. She stated when she was in the park she heard more gunshots but didn't see the source of the gunfire. So how many shooters does that make and what are their locations? Because not being able to match up shooters and locations to the official narrative, if there's an extra one or two or three or four or five shooters, that could account for everything. Again, I'm not saying that that's what happened, but if that's what happened, would that make all of this Whitney's testimony match up better? And then, of course, she mentioned the uh, Van Courtney Vandell. She stated she did not see Courtney at school April 20th. This is the only info she could provide at this time, and the interview was concluded. Okay, another report here. So this is May 27th, the report dated 28th. Leanne Clark was contacted at her residence, and following her being provided a verbal admonition, she was presented two photo arrays. One lineup consisted of the photographs of Redacted and Others, and the second was that of Redacted and Others. So I guess these are two different redacted. And it looks like they forgot to redact Joe Stair. She first carefully examined the Stair lineup and related that none of the individuals pictured was the subject she had seen on the telephone at Columbine High April 20th. She next examined the redacted lineup and following her looking at all the individual pictures, pointed to photo number six redacted and said he closely resembled the subject she had seen on the payphone at Columbine High School at approximately 0900 morning of the shootings. She felt confident of her identification and noted she did not know the subject as being a student at Columbine High. She went on to say that the subject had been using the payphones located near the attendance office and had been on the payphone nearest the interior wall. I'm assuming they must have they must have traced the calls that that party was making and I wonder where that would lead. Also there's no further information here so Curious, very curious. Again, nothing 100%, not enough follow-ups, but we're looking at a lot of redacteds here. So John Cook is next, 754 to 759. First report, no handwritten statement here. First report dated April 28, 1999. Suspect descriptions. White male, approximately 6 foot 1, 165 pounds. Brown goldish color hair, collar length, even on the sides, parted in the middle. How, so he could not tell if it was parted in the middle. The guy's wearing a hat, so this guy's not wearing a hat. Parted in the middle, 
wearing a black trench coat, pants were darker dark blue, combat boots dark green t-shirt, carrying a rifle or shotgun with a barrel length of approximately one and a half feet, the gun was black in color. Suspect number two, white male, 6'3 or 6'4, 170 pounds, brown hair parted in the middle, shoulder length, wearing sunglasses, carrying a shotgun or a rifle one and a half feet long, black in color, wearing a trench coat, black combat boots. Investigation. April 20th, I contacted John Cook, at which time I interviewed him in the parking lot of Clement Park. Cook stated that he thought the shooting started at about 11.30 and he was in the senior parking lot when the shooting started. He stated he saw two guys wearing black trench coats, which he described above. He stated that one of the suspects, suspect number one, opened his trench coat during the incident and suspect number two did not open his trench coat. Does that mean the trench coat was buttoned up? He stated during the shooting he saw one of the suspects take off his trench coat, at which time he saw a rifle or shotgun with straps attached to it. He stated that both suspects were holding a rifle or shotgun and that they started shooting at a groups of kids randomly. Cook said that he saw four students hit by rounds. He stated that one of the people he saw hit was Mike Johnson and that he got hit on the right leg and then he saw blood coming out of his leg. He stated that he saw another male by the name of Mark fall to the ground, also saw a girl, white female, brown hair in the corner of the parking lot. He saw one white male with blonde hair fall after being shot. Cook stated that he has seen both of the described suspects at Columbine High School before. He stated he does not know their names but believes they are seniors. Cook said when the shooting started, he knew it was real and took off running. He stated he ran behind a shed on the football field where he dropped his backpack. He stated that he ran over to the baseball field to the dugout, then left the dugout and climbed the fence to the maintenance facility at Clement Park until he was contacted by police officers. Cook stated he believed he could ID the suspects if he saw photos of them again. He also again stated that he believed both of the suspects are students at Columbine High. So this is weird because this is April 28th when supposedly the narrative has already been established, Eric and Dylan, and yet he's talking as if they're not Eric and Dylan and he needs to identify them. What does that mean? John stated he did not know any of the Trenchcoat Mafia, but answered the question that he was aware of a Trenchcoat Mafia senior last year who had long black hair who had committed suicide. And that's all there is there. No follow-up there. So I can't find the exact news report where they stated the names of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, but I believe it was at some point the night of and I believe they had the images from the cafeteria the night of, if not the next day. So it's kind of strange how 10 days later, he's talking about IDing the particular suspects he saw if he could see photos of them, because Eric and Dylan were already all over the place. So he's clearly not referring to Eric or Dylan here. That's John Cook. All right, let's move on to Frank DeAngelis, the actual principal. I'm not going to go over his whole account. I'm just going to go over his spotting of a potential suspect. So starting on document 5675, Frank DeAngelis speculated he left his office sometime around 1120. Frank told the investigative officer he recalled almost immediately upon leaving the front office area, he knew something was strange. When asked... To elaborate, Frank DeAngelis told I.O. he did not recall seeing anyone at the phone banks in the North Hall. Frank DeAngelis told I.O. that normally this was a particularly busy area, especially during the start of a lunch. Frank reiterated the situation was strange and that the phone bank in the North Hallway area near the entrance was not active with students. According to Frank, he did not recall seeing any students located in the North Hall area after exiting the main office. Frank DeAngelis told I.O. moments after exiting the office and proceeding west down the North Hall, he heard Susan White, his secretary, exit the office and yell down to him, there's gunfire in the cafeteria. Frank DeAngelis stated he knew Susan White was serious, but also recalled thinking this couldn't be happening. He told I.O. his initial reaction was to tell Susan White to return to the office and call 911. According to Frank DeAngelis, Susan White immediately complied with the request. When asked where he was located at the point Susan White advised him of the shooting, Frank DeAngelis stated he was somewhere near the trophy case, which is located a short distance west of the entrance of the school main office area. Frank explained he was in the process of proceeding westbound on the main hall, the North Hall, which required him to pass the trophy case. He clarified the trophy case was located east of the phone banks he had previously mentioned. 
He went on to state, after being provided with the information per Susan White, he was walking more briskly en route to the common area in order to assess the situation. Frank stated, based on his recollection, as soon as he turned back around after contact with Susan White and proceeded westbound, he saw a figure of an individual down toward the far west end of the North Hall. Frank D'Angelo stated the individual was near the west exit entrance outside. When asked if he could identify the individual, Frank responded in the negative. He stated he could not even state for certain the individual was male, but did believe the person was tall and slender, possibly wearing a white cap, referring to a ball cap, turned backwards. He also thought that the individual was wearing a white t-shirt with a black vest. Frank reiterated he could not see the individu individual well enough to confirm sex or identity. He went on to state almost as soon as he had made the observation, he began to hear a pop sound. According to Frank, the pop sound was not any type of rapid fire and may have only been a single shot. I.O. confirmed with Frank that he believed the pop was the sound of gunfire. He stated his speculation, the individual he could see at the far west entrance, was the individual firing a weapon. Frank stated he could not describe the weapon being fired, but believed the individual was holding it with two hands at the time. He stated it appeared to him as though the weapon was initially fired. The suspect had pointed the muzzle of the gun up in the air. However, the next shots were fired at the exterior west doors, which then entered into the vestibule. I.O. clarified with Frank DeAngelis he was describing the two sets of doors which lead out from the west entrance exit. I.O. further clarified with Frank when he initially observed the individual described above, the person was standing outside the school at the west entrance. So apparently there's also other documents which relate that this, he might have seen somebody with cut off sleeves, which is curious. So again, this is only one write-up of a report. I'm going to go over something else that's curious here. In document 5671, and this was May 17th, 99, report by Jacqueline D. Investigator responded to Chatfield High School to meet with principal of Columbine High School, Frank DeAngelis. Also present was investigator Russ Boatwright with Arvada Police Department. On May 4th, 1999, this investigator had received information that a group of boys had detonated an unidentified explosive on April 11th, 1999. On April 30th, 99, this investigator had also received information that a group of boys fitting the same description were overheard talking at Columbine High School on April 19th about detonating something on April 20th. I mean, this, this is some mind-shocking info. This is bombshell info. This investigator was also advised that during the latter incident, Mr. DeAngelis had asked the same group of boys to quiet down due to their rowdy behavior. The investigator questioned Mr. DeAngelis about the aforementioned incident that occurred on April 19th. Mr. DeAngelis advised the following. He had been contacted by Barb Larson, who he had interviewed for a teaching position on April 19th in regards to the aforementioned sometime last week. Larson advised him she saw five tall kids. Okay, so that... That does not narrow it down in the least, unless Eric Harris might not be part of that group of tall kids, and of course Brian Sargent is not. But you got guys like Chris Morris, Robert Perry, Zach Heckler, maybe Nate Dykeman. You got these over, all of these guys over six feet tall, well over six feet tall. So she, that I mean, and they're wearing trench coats. So clearly, she's talking about trench coat mafia individuals. She saw five tall kids that day wearing dusters and talking about detonating something. As she walked by, they said, shh, and then exited the building, whooping and hollering. Now, that clearly does sound like, uh, like troublesome teenagers. Larson also described one person in the group as having white hair and black eyebrows. Now, I'm assuming this is bleached white blonde hair. I mean, how many teenagers have white hair naturally, I don't know. She said tall kids, so not older people, tall kids wearing dusters. So Frank DeAngelis does not recall asking anyone to be quiet prior to his interview with Larson and further advised that he would have recalled that if they were being rowdy as described by Larson. Or would he lie about all this to save his own butt because if it, if it got out in the open that there were kids talking about detonating devices the, the day before... 
on the next day and he did nothing about it. I mean, this is crazy. He stated he does not believe he is blanking anything out and feels that if it occurred, he would have remembered it. He recalls stepping out of his office to meet Larson, who was sitting in the office area waiting for an interview. Then, after greeting her, they went on to it, into his office where he interviewed her. He does not recall any kids at Columbine High School that fit the description of the subject described by Larson. So I'm assuming the white-haired subject. So nobody had their hair bleached white on that particular week. Curious. Very, very curious. And I can't find a report from Larson. You would think she would have been interviewed. Perhaps there is a report. I don't see I don't see it here though. But if someone does have it, they can share it. Because it would be curious what her interview said if she was interviewed about these group of tall kids talking about detonating devices and then saying shh as soon as an adult walked by. I mean, this is mind-shocking information, mind-shocking revelations. Let's move on to David Eagle, 1877 to 1886. This is his handwritten statement, April 20th, 3.30 p.m., mere hours later. So he heard about 15 shots. They turn over the tables. After I saw a guy with a gun by the door at the science rooms. In the hallway just outside the science room. The guy had uh, shot barrels. That's supposed to be shotgun or something. The barrel was hidden under a rifle. The guy with the gun had black hair. Looked like it was spiked. Shaved on the sides, also was blonde on top, a little part. So he had black hair with some blonde highlights. Couldn't see his face because of the spiked, because of the SPCK. I can't, I, I can't read this guy's handwriting. It's pretty bad. He was a white male, about five nine. So I. Eric Harris doesn't have black, black hair with blonde highlights, though. About 18 years old, no facial hair. Unsure something had because of SP, looks like S-O-U-K. Thinking he had a black shirt, didn't see, okay. So, terrible handwriting, but let's see what the supplemental report says. April 28th, 99, regarding interview April 27th. David parents were present during the interview. This is PJ Doyle. David said that he was in the science room taking a test, heard explosions, fire alarm went off. Students started walking towards the door to leave as is customary when the fire alarm goes off. Mr. Johnson started to yell to get back and down. Johnson came in, locked the doors, went back to his classroom. There is a door between the two classrooms. About five minutes later, Mr. Johnson came back and helped to turn the tables over. David was sitting behind the, the turned over desks. He could see out the window in the door. Thought uh, through it, he saw the killers. He said one was holding a sawed-off shotgun. The killer was holding it with the barrel pointing up. There was smoke in the hall. David described this person holding the gun as someone with black shaved hair with blonde streaks. I mean, who does that sound like? That doesn't sound like anybody named yet. The hair was longer on the top than it was on the bottom. He couldn't see any facial features because of the smoke and shadows. He has since seen pictures of Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold on television. He did not know these students from school. David said that the person he saw did not look like the people he's seen on television. Let me read that one more time for all those devout coincidence theorists out there. David said the person he saw did not look like the people he's seen on television. David said that he saw the person with the gun from the chest up. He could see a black shirt, the sleeves stopping on the arms like a t-shirt would fit. David said that there was another person standing next to the killer, but he couldn't see the person at all. David said he sat behind the tables and watched the two walk away. He said that one of the two had jiggled the door handle but did not come in. 
David said the SWAT guys came into the room, escorted them out to the cafeteria. He saw no duffel bags or canisters that day. Interesting. So on this, again, back to the Team 4 interview guidelines, minimal questions. Number seven, have you heard anything from anybody else about other suspects? Bomb making, gun buying, etc. John Sfalinger, Clement Park manager, said some kids ran to the office to get help. And someone said he saw five shooters. And of course, this will not be the first time we hear of this. And a lot of these witnesses, they're seeing these shooters at once. So the coincidence theorists who desperately try to maintain the idiot box narrative and try to say, oh, it was just Eric and Dylan, but they took off their trench coats at one time and then walked to another area. Some witnesses stated they saw them all at the same time. So who knows? So, and then following up here, David Eagle was in science room, saw a man with shaved black hair with blonde streaks holding a sawed-off shotgun. That's a weird thing to hallucinate, though. And if this is a fog of war situation, why are other students not mistaking Eric Harris for some guy with uh, shaved black hair, blonde streaks? He also said the hair on the top was a bit longer, like spiked up a bunch. Which is pretty, I mean, that's not, depending on how, I mean, he doesn't say exactly how many inches. I mean, if it's a number of inches, I mean, that, that would be definitely an unusual sight that you would remember. And in seeing photos of Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold, you would clearly be able to tell it's not them if it wasn't them. A couple more clues here. This is a Reeker report, May 21st, 99. On May 21st, 99, Investigator Reeker did, a con did conduct an interview with David Eagle at his residence with his mother present. Eagle states that he was in a science room during the shooting and that while hiding behind the tables, he observed a white male party through the door window. The male subject rattled the door of the classroom and that this male was wearing a black shirt and had black hair which was dyed with blonde streaks and was shaved on the sides. The male party appeared to have a physical defect as he appeared to have a very long face. That's kind of weird. Is he talking about acne or something else, like a scar? Eagle states that the suspect had a shotgun resting on his shoulder, and that he caught a glimpse of a second person with him, but Eagle cannot describe the second person. So again, clearly he's not making stuff up. It's not like he's just making up random things. He didn't really see the second person, so he can't confirm or deny who the second individual is. Eagle did initially, okay, did initial the photo, states that he cannot be sure this is the person whom he saw, and it doesn't say who he identified here. Okay, he could not provide any further information or description. And there is no follow-up interview in October or November, so who knows, did they get him to say that it was Dylan, even though it wasn't? Uh, I don't know, I don't know, weird. Very, very weird. Let's go to Ashley Eagleund, and this one is very, very damning. Yeah, document number 22,672, prepared by Tim Steffes. Actually, we could look at the previous document, 22,671. Ashley was in North Corridor when she observed redacted and Eric Harris coming around the corner from the library into the North Corridor. Redacted had a handgun and Eric had a shotgun. Both started shooting at Ashley and a girl named Lacey. Ashley did not know Redacted at first, but she saw his picture in the yearbook and is positive it was Redacted. Is she talking? Who's she talking about here? She's talking about Robert Perry? Interview done on April 27th. Inc. Eagleland advised she came out of gym class, encountered Lacey in North Hall at the same time. She saw two shooters. Eric Harris and Redacted, not Dylan Klebold, at the junction of the library in North Hall. Both subjects opened fire on her. No photo lineup per investigator baton. And why not? So this is now in... This is now... Okay. Ashley was in the North Court. Okay, coming. So she's positive it was Redacted. And there's a further note here. Hmm. Curious. All right, let's go to Amy Evans, 22,205. So before we get into Amy Evans' account, there's an interview here with Melissa Chorus. And this was an interview April 20th, or actually, 
whereabouts interview regarding her whereabouts on April 20th. The interview took place May 28th. She left Columbine at 11.20 a.m. to go to Stony Creek Elementary, where she is a teacher's assistant. She did not see anything. Her friend Amy Evans said there was a third shooter, and it was redacted. So now, let's go to Amy Evans' account. And this is document 2961, dated report 5799. I spoke with Amy Evans by telephone. A whole bunch of redacted here. Man, two sentences, or a whole, almost a whole, more than a sentence completely redacted. She said she did not know who Eric was, but did not ever associate with him. She did say she had classes with Dylan, but had not really spent any time with him. She said she did know both Eric and Dylan were made fun of because they wore their black trench coats even on hot days. She said she ran with a different group of people. She said she was considered popular in school. She was a member of homecoming royalty and played several sports. She told me she was in the cafeteria when the shooting started. She also told me she had a meeting planned this morning with an investigator to discuss what happened. A whole nother line redacted. Who knows what it says. This entire sentence. And it's and it only gets worse. So follow up document 2962. Date of interview May 10th, 99, 455 p.m. Agent Larry A. Brown. Evans stated she was seated in the southeast corner of Columbine High Cafeteria when the incident began. Evans said she was sitting with Jamie Erickson, Tina Bernacci, Matt Oliver, Kelly Adragna. She was wearing a red tank top with navy blue and beige stripes, blue jeans, brown clock style shoes. According to Evans, she entered the cafeteria at approximately 11.11 a.m. and came from the science hall after attending Mr. Friesen's class. Evans stated she did not notice any duffel bags in the cafeteria, nor did she see anyone carrying duffel bags in or near the school prior to the incident. Evans stated she did not recall seeing Harris or Claybold on the day of the shooting or the day before the shooting. When asked if she spoke to any members of the Trenchcoat Mafia prior to the incident, Evans said she spoke to Brooks Brown on April 19th and 20th. Evans said she and Brown talked about the prom on April 19th. On April 20th, she also talked to Brown during their first hour gym class. According to Evans, Brown appeared normal and indicated nothing out of character. Now we have another two or three sentences redacted, just an entire black spot. I mean, this looks like some kind of UFO report from the government. I don't know what any of these sentences say, but they're entire blacked out sentences, not just people's names. Evans said she has not heard of any other people suspected of being involved, of people making bombs, or anyone other than Robin Anderson buying weapons for Harrison Klebold. According to Evans, she heard teachers yelling, telling people to get down while she was in the cafeteria. Evans said she walked toward the windows when she heard popping noises coming from outside. Evans stated she briefly saw a male wearing a trench coat running around outside of the cafeteria. She could not describe the person and said she did not see a weapon. She thought it was a senior prank, as many people expected seniors to start playing pranks on one another at the school. When teachers said there was gunfire, she went back to cover under the table. Teachers then told everyone to get out. Evans said she exited through the southeast cafeteria door and ran southeast through the school parking lot. Okay. Evans said she always saw Zach Heckler with Klebold and Harris in the school parking lot. Heckler always parked his vehicle next to Klebold's vehicle. And curious, no follow-up reports of any kind. I mean, that was so far the most redacted report I've seen so far, with entire sentences redacted. Let's go to Joel Hatfield. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go over two documents actually. Let's go over his report, document thirty-two fifty-eight, regarding an April twenty-ninth interview. Joel Hatfield, okay, he was in English class until 11.10, got out of class, went to his locker, stated he was with PJ. PJ went to his locker, Joel went to cafeteria via interior stairs. Joel stated there was nothing unusual at the time. Okay, returned to the, t okay, then he went to cafeteria table, then he sat there 15 minutes, heard, heard a single pop. He stated it sounded like a paintball gun. Joel stated that moments later he got up to throw something in the trash, and as he did so, he looked out the west windows. Joel gave the following account while looking out the window. Observed a single gunman described as a white male about six feet tall with a medium build. Oval face, no glasses, no facial hair, and red ear length hair. Not collar length, not longer than shoulders, 
red ear length hair. He was wearing a black baseball hat backwards. The gunman was standing north of the chain link fence east of the sidewalk. Gunman was facing Joel. Gunman did not have anything over his face and was wearing dark blue jeans with no holes or patches. Joel stated he was he had a white shirt believed to be a t-shirt and a light colored vest with pockets. He stated that the vest was weighed down because it was not flapping like the front of his coat. Joel stated the gunman had a black trench coat on that went to about the middle of his lower legs. He stated that it was open and flapping in the wind. No logos or identifiers on the trench. Joel stated the gunman did not have any gloves on, could not see his feet. He had a gray semi-auto handgun in his right hand. Again, is Dylan Klebold left-handed? He stated that the gun was T-shaped and there was about 5 inches in front of and behind the pistol grip. The gun had a long clip in it. Joel stated gunman fired a single shot at Mike Johnson, who was on the hill west of the sidewalk. He stated that this shot was fired at Mike Johnson's knee. Stated gunman turned to an unknown direction and fired a bunch of shots, rapid fire while turning. Okay, Joel stated gunman then fired a single shot at the guy who was standing near the chain link fence, north side and the upper body. The shooting victim fell to the ground on the east side of the walkway. Joel stated he did not have anything in his left hand at the time. He stated the gunman then changed clips but does not know what he did with the clip that he took out. Joel stated gunman then walked up the hill north, picked up a shotgun that was lying on the ground. Huh, okay. He does not remember if it was on the sidewalk or not. Joel described the shotgun as a short side-by-side -side double barrel shotgun. Joel stated that he picked the shotgun up and held it in his left hand. Joel stated that the gunman came back down the hill toward the shooting victim near the fence, the chest wound on the ground, and pointed the shotgun at him and fired two times. And then a janitor came in, yelled everybody to get down. He did not see the gunman come into the cafeteria. He said he never saw a second or third gunman. No duffel bags. Okay. Another curiosity. So they were in the laundry room. He stated the janitor had a radio. He communicated to somebody on the outside and they told us to stay in there. Joel stated that he heard what he thought was a fire extinguisher going off for a couple of minutes after they got into the room. He stated that they continued to hear gunshots from above. Joel stated somebody knocked on the door and wanted to come in. He stated that this person slipped his ID under the door which read Jeremy, but that they did not open the door for him. He stated that Paul Andrews still has the ID to date. And that's curious. Uh, I'm sure some researcher can nail that down. Was there a real Jeremy? Or was this an individual who stole somebody's ID and wanted to get in either guilty or innocent? If this was not a suspect, somebody who didn't have an ID but picked up somebody else's ID? Or was that really their ID? Joel stated SWAT eventually got to them and they went from the laundry room to the teacher's lounge lounge out the window up the hill to a fire department vehicle. Joel stated he did not know the gunman but could recognize the one shooter in a photo lineup if he had to. He stated he had never heard of Dylan Klebold or Eric Harris prior to the event and only saw them on the television or the newspaper. So clearly the shooter he saw wasn't them because he's offering to, to recognize the one shooter in a photo lineup. And no follow-up here. Document 19277 basically says the same thing. Saw one shooter with excellent description of dress, physical guns and movements, could ID in lineup if needed. So this is April 30th. So it's already, Eric and Dylan are already plastered all over the news. And he's offering to ID who he saw in a photo lineup if it was necessary because clearly he's not talking about Eric or Dylan here. What do we make of that? I don't know what to make of that. Now we have Mark Hengel's account, which is quite curious in the report. Or Mark Hengel, rather. 5898 to 5903. FBI report dated April 28, 99. Hengel started, Hengel started to walk to his locker located in the east-west hallway on the south side of the auditorium near the Science 12 room. And this interview was conducted on the 27th. While he was on the stairs located at the southeast corner of the cafeteria, he heard a lot of commotion coming from the cafeteria. He looked down into the cafeteria, saw people moving around and heard screaming. He also heard shots and the sound of projectiles striking walls and lockers, which at first he thought were paintballs from the sound and 
striking rounds made, he started back down the stairs and heard someone sh shout, Mark, get out, someone has a gun. Hengel was able to look outside the window on the stairs and saw several students trying to hide and others lying on the ground on the south side of the cafeteria. Mr. Sanders, a teacher at Columbine High, began telling everyone to head downstairs into the cafeteria, but after hearing gunfire, he told everyone to go upstairs. A large group of students went up the stairs on the southeast corner of the cafeteria and once at the top, ran to the right and east through the east-west hallway on the south side of the auditorium and out the exit by the math area. Hengel, Witt, and Mr. Sanders went to the left towards the library, and Hengel and Witt hid behind a pillar near the top of the stairs. After hearing gunfire, Hengel peeked out from behind the pillar, looked down the north-south hallway next to the library. In the corner of this hallway, in the east-west hallway on the north side of the auditorium, Hengel saw two white males dressed all in black whom he did not recognize. Hengel saw one of the individuals who was tall and skinny, dressed in black pants, black boots, black trench coat, repeatedly fire a gun. Hengel was unable to describe it further, east down the hallway towards the administration and main offices. Hengel could see the shell casings ejecting and what he thought were bullets coming from the muzzle of the gun. Next to the tall, skinny shooter, Hengel saw another person, also dressed in a black trench coat, bending over a large black duffel bag. This person appeared to be looking for something in the bag. Since the person's back was to Hengel, he could not provide a description of this person other than he had the impression he was overweight. That's kind of curious, because who would fit that description other than Brian Sargent? Unless, of course, you say his impression was wrong and he thought skinny Eric Harris was overweight or skinny Dylan Klebold was overweight. After taking this quick peek from behind the pillar, Hengel turned to say something to Witt and saw Mr. Sanders lying on the floor near the top of the stairs with blood all around him. Hengel and Witt then ran east to the east-west hallway on the south side of the auditorium and out the exit by the math area. They continued to run to a nearby house where they called their parents to let them know they were safe. Hengel first heard about Trenchcoat Mafia last year. He only knew two of the members of the group, which he described as composed with weird people, who dressed in black clothes and wore trench coats and played weird card games with pictures of nuclear weapons on the cards. Dylan Klebold was in his video production class last semester. Hengel never talked to him but knew who he was because he stood out as a result of his attire. Klebold always dressed in black, wore a black trench, and tucked in his trousers into military-style boots. He had long, shaggy hair. Hengel also knew Chris Morris, who was in his science class. He described Morris as nice but rather weird, who also dresses in black clothes, including a black trench coat and a black beret. Morris once told him, I don't believe in God. I follow Satan's commandments. And we are all part of a big computer game and someone else controls our lives. Now, that's a really creepy statement. Some believe that if this was a big MK Ultra operation and a lot of the trench coat mafia were involved not just dylan and eric that's why he said something like that morris also once told hengel and other students how to manufacture napalm and described the procedures and ingredients required morris did not indicate he had ever made napalm but gave the impression he knew what he was doing hengel identified klebold and redacted from the photograph in the attached 1a envelope Hengel was unable to identify Eric Harris, whom he does not know. Also attached is a one envelope is a diagram of Columbine High School indicating the location of Hengel and the two individuals dressed in black. So he did identify Klebold and someone else. Is this Chris Morris who he's talking about here? Or is it someone else? Hmm. Follow-up report here, October 13th, 99, regarding the October 7th re-interview. And so... As gunfire was erupting, Hengel looked down north-south hallway beyond the library, reported seeing tall, skinny shooter near the far end of the hall. Hengel told investigators he saw another person next to the tall, skinny shooter. Hengel stated this other person was dressed in a black trench coat, bending over a large duffel bag. This person's back was to Hengel. He could not provide a description other than he had the impression that the other person appeared to be overweight. Hengel told me he was approximately 50, 60 feet away from the shooters. He stated that the shooters were, the, were where the hallway intersects just inside the west upper doors. Stated the tall, skinny shooter was shooting down the hallway toward the gym. Hengel had a side view of the shooter. Hengel could not recall if the shooter was wearing a hat. 
In reference to the gun the shooter was using, Hengel could only describe it as a long gun. Hengel told me that he cannot positively... He told me that he now cannot positively say that the other person who was bending over the duffel bag was wearing a trench coat. So he might have not even been wearing a coat and was simply overweight. Hengel stated that the person did look overweight. He never saw the person stand up. Hengel told me that the tall person who was shooting was wearing a trench coat. He stated his observations of these two persons were for just a couple seconds, and then he ran east down a hallway from the shooting. Now, here's a very interesting paragraph. Is this the investigator growing frustrated, Mr. Luciano here? I then explained to Mark Kengel and his father that the investigation into the Columbine High School shootings has been extremely thorough. I further explained that the overwhelming evidence in the case clearly reveals that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold acted alone. This is to include the planning as well as the actual shootings. Actually, I explained that there is no evidence to indicate that anyone other than Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold had prior knowledge of the shooting. I then advised Mark Hengel that the skinny person he saw standing and shooting was Dylan Klebold and the person he saw bending over the duffel bag was Eric Harris. I explained that the task force investigators now know this based on physical evidence as well as other eyewitnesses. In reference to Hengel describing the person bent over the duffel bag as looking overweight, I explained that Eric Harris had web gear on and a utility belt. He was also wearing cargo pants. There were explosives stuffed into the pockets of his pants and ammunition attached on and around the web gear and utility belt, which may explain why Harris looked overweight. Both Mark and his father understood and were comfortable with the information I explained in the interview. The interview was concluded without any concerns referencing additional gunmen. So clearly, the fix was in for them to establish the narrative. And of course, they say the, overwhelming, the evidence is overwhelming, yet they're ignoring all evidence that points to other shooters. Now, in regards to Eric Harris looking overweight with all of the gear, I don't know. Is that plausible? I don't know. It's just he's so skinny in general. And if he was, see, if he was wearing a coat and he's bent over a bag, yeah, sure. But he's stating he wasn't sure. He's not sure if he's wearing a coat or not. If he's not wearing a coat, like you can see from the picture, even in the cafeteria, I mean, I don't know, from a distance and above, I mean, is it easier to see he's overweight from straight behind? It just, it, I don't know, maybe he looks, you could say he looks overweight. Either way, there's no positive ID here by any stretch of the imagination. But the desperation the investigator has here in trying to explain away what he saw and the way he's doing it is very curious. Very, very curious. So next we're going to move to one of the one of the victims, Anne Marie Hushelter, who was one of the gunshot victims outside of the cafeteria. Now, this definitely points to the area of a cover up. Because I'm going to go through her report. So this is document 214, 215, 216. Date of the report, April 29th, 99, regarding April 27th at 315. Special Agent Mike Barnett and I went to Swedish Hospital to interview victim Hoshelter. Victim Hoshelter stated that after fourth period, at about 11.10 a.m., she went to the publications room for a few minutes, then walked down to the grassy area, which is located outside the library on the southwest corner of the school. Hoshelter said she began to eat her lunch with Jason Ottenrieff and Kim Blair. Hoshelter stated sometime between 11.15 and 11.20, she observed two gunmen. Now, keep in mind, this is the typed report, so we do not have her statement. The first gunman she described as a white male, black hair, brown eyes, black and Black hat, black boots, black cargo pants, a black shirt, black trench coat, carrying a black vinyl duffel bag, round in shape and about two and a half feet long, with a black gun. Number two gunman was a white male with a shotgun, carrying a duffel bag, wearing all black to include a, a black trench coat. Hoshelter said she saw these gunmen standing at the top of the stairs at the southwest corner by the library. Hoshelter said she observed both individuals shooting towards the west and towards the parking lot. At first, she thought it was a joke, but almost immediately realized that it was for real when she saw students getting shot in the legs. By the way, it is curious how so many witnesses describe two gunmen shooting, one gunman. I mean, these accounts are all over the place, but supposedly they have a clear view here. What, what would account for that? Other than multiple shooters, or at least other individuals in the mix.
even if they weren't shooters, other trench coat mafia members running around doing whatever. Hoshelter said she observed both individuals shooting toward the west and towards the parking lot. At first, she thought it was a joke, but almost immediately realized that it was for real when she saw students getting shot in the legs. Hoshelter said it was about this time they began to run to the cafeteria when gunman 2 shot her. Hoshelter said she believes she was shot with a shotgun due to the noise of the blast. Hoshelter said she was unable to walk after being shot and that Jason Othenrieth drug her to an area by the wall directly in front of the cafeteria. Hoshelter stated while she was lying on the ground after being shot, she heard shooting and bombs going off. Hoshelter also said that she heard the first gunman yelling orders to the other gunman, but could not recall exactly what he was saying. Hoshelter stated that while she was lying on the ground playing dead, that she believes the gunman may have walked down the stairs towards the south parking area. Hoshelter stated she laid in the same position playing dead until she was rescued. Hoshelter also stated that while lying in the grass, she heard a lot of noise and shooting in the library area. Hoshelter stated she would like to be interviewed further at a later date. Due to her medical condition, I felt she needed to rest, and the interview was terminated at this time. And there is no follow-up interview here. And so Jason Ottenreth's and Kim Blair's statements, uh, we, don't have no, we, we do not have uh, Ottenreth. We just have a uh, typed statement saying he did ID Eric Harris, nobody, uh, but not Dylan Klebold. And we don't have his handwritten statement. So again... And, and Kim Blair, same thing. We do not have a positive ID from her. She does not ID anybody. So, and there's no follow-up. There's no mentioning of IDing anybody. And now let's get to this curious document. 18218. And this, this is truly a big mind shock. So, this is... Sarah Spaulding, prepared by Dan Harris. Sarah Spaulding, Swedish Hospital, advised Anne-Marie Hoshelter, victim, would like to talk with the police or sheriff. Will Paige Harris, when she awakes, advised that Harris slash Klebold. So, Paige Harris, this is Dan Harris, I guess, hospital staff or police... Will Paige Harris, when she arrives, advised that Harris and Klebold did not shoot her. Let me read that again for the coincidence theorists. So, Swedish hospital staff, Sarah Spaulding, advised that Anne-Marie Hoshelter, victim, would like to talk with police slash sheriff, advised that Harris Klebold did not shoot her. And the lead here, lead control number DN 1481, interview Anne-Marie Hoshelter, victim of incident in Swedish hospital, has an ID on the shooters, was shot outside of school. Assigned to Mike Barnett, date April 27th, 1999, time 12.29 p.m. April 17th. Barnett and McFadden interviewed Hoshelter at Swedish Hospital. Hoshelter said that at fourth period, she went to publications for a few minutes, then walked to the grassy area outside the library, southwest corner. Hoshelter said she began to eat lunch with Jason Ottenreth and Kim Blair. Hoshelter said that between 11.15 and 11.20, she observed two gunmen. White, uh, gunman number one, white male, 6'4", black hair, brown eyes, black hat and boots, Black cargo pants, black vinyl duffel bag, round in shape, about two and a half feet long with a black gun. Number two, white male, shotgun, carrying duffel bag, black trench coat, all in black, standing at the top of the stairs, southwest corner by library. Hoshelter said that at first she thought it might be a joke, but quickly realized it was not when she saw both gunmen shooting towards the mountains and south parking lot. Hoshelter said they began to run towards the cafeteria. Gunman number two shot her. Hoshelter believed with a shotgun. Hoshelter said that she was unable to walk. Jason drug her to the cafeteria wall. Saw the gunman shooting at students' legs. First gunman yelling orders to the other gunman. Hoshelter said that she thinks the gunman walked down the stairs towards the parking lot while she laid on the grass. Hoshelter said she played dead until rescued. And so they, again, they're typing up this report. They're not saying who she identified. They're just saying gunman number one and two. And in the previous lead sheet, we have here, she said that Harris and Klebold did not shoot her. So none of these individuals are Harris and Klebold. 
She also said individual one is 6'4", and one was yelling orders to the other. So Dale, if it was Dylan Klebold, he's yelling orders to Eric Harris. Most people assume it would be the other way around. But apparently she's stating that she was not shot by Klebold or Eric Harris. Why is this information not talked about? Where are the follow-up interviews? And who did she ID? That would be curious. Or was she not able to make an ID and she just knew it wasn't Eric or Dylan based on their pictures? So continuing on the list here, we have an entry for Lee Kamens. And uh, there's a little bit of an error here because it's not referencing what Star Viego is saying here on the forum. But let's go to Lee Kamen's account, which is curious for a few other reasons. So Lee Kamen's knows Eric Harris. This is her report. Document number 3408, and she wrote this on May 3rd, so not day of. I am a senior at Columbine. I arrive at school at 7.15 a.m., and I come in through the doors of the cafeteria. On the day of the incident, I left school at the beginning of period 4 at about 10.25 to run to Target and pick up some pictures. When I uh, As I returned or when I was returning to Columbine at about 10.55 a.m., as I turned to go into the parking lot, I saw Eric Harris in a silver car turning right out of the parking lot. I have known Eric since the seventh grade. I waved at him and said hi. He waved back. His movement was, can't make out that word, and possibly salutary. I parked in the senior lot, got out of my car, met my friends, walked up to the school together, entering in the library. We waited for our friends next to the choir room and then went downstairs. I put my backpack down on the choir chair, I guess, something, and then walked out to get my food, returned and see my food, set my food down. But before I could sit down, the incident started. Uh, it looks like 10 girls or so run in to say there's a shooter out in the parking lot. Mr. Sanders and the two janitors told us to get down. I was against the wall on the floor. The people towards the window then started to run for the stairs. We were something on the floor. We stayed there for a minute. Then I looked around the corner and saw a white male, very tall, with long light brown hair, with a dark duster type trench coat. He appeared to have a long gun up his right sleeve. Is Dylan Klebold left-handed? I didn't look at his face. The person fired one shot through the window into the cafeteria. I ducked back. I looked around and saw the gunman was in the school. As the gunman raised his arm and we ran down the hall and into a classroom with Miss Lucas and Miss Kelly stayed there for 20 something minutes we heard gunshots and then ran out of the school then she lists the people that were with her so, so a couple of curiosities here on the team four interview guideline minimal questions to be asked so she does not see duffel bags she did not see anyone carrying or in possession of duffel bags now on the question did you see eric harris or dylan klebold on monday or tuesday she said yes eric was leaving the student lot at 10.50 a.m. by himself in his Honda. Very curious there, no mention of Dylan Klebold. So this is not a positive ID on Dylan Klebold. However, it's not stating she identified somebody else, but what's also curious is there's absolutely no follow-up here. Again, we don't know how many documents have not been released. Many, many documents, no doubt. So, Star Viego gave the document 1422, which is actually not Lee Kamen's. It is Trista Fogarty. And this is a report dated June 16th, 99, regarding June 15th interview of Trista Fogarty. So she said on April 20th, she ditched her first hour class at Columbine High School so she could work on homework for another class. She went to the Columbine High School Library, arriving at approximately 7.45. She said she was in the library for approximately 10 minutes. 
Upon my asking her, Trista told me she did not see anything unusual. She did say she saw a suspicious female working at one of the computers in the library that Trista said may possibly have been Alex Marsh. However, she was not positive. I asked Trista why she felt this person was suspicious, and the only reason she could give was that the the way that the female had looked at her in the library. And it, it is obviously very difficult because in high school, obviously, we have a lot of angsty teenagers who some of which may not like each other for reasons not known to the other individual. And it might have nothing to do with the incident. On the other hand, we do have people's intuition and what it tells them from body language or looks and sensing something might be off. So again, we can't really make anything of that. Trista said she left the library after 10 minutes and proceeded from the library down the stairway to the cafeteria where she selected a table next to the stairway. And it's curious, did she leave the library because of the way Alex Marsh was looking at her? Or did she just grab what she needed and the plan was never to stay in the library but would go to the cafeteria? Who knows? The table selected may have possibly been LL on the Columbine High School cafeteria diagram. So she was with, okay, a bunch of other students until 8.23. She remembered looking at the clock when they left, saying to one of her friends that they only had two minutes to get to their English classroom. Trista said she proceeded to leave the cafeteria and went up the stairway to the second level. She said when she got to the top of the stairway, she walked down the science and math hallway to her school hallway locker. So, wow, that's funny. She said the locker number is either 587 or 588. She doesn't know her locker number. <laughs> I don't know why I find that funny, but by the end of the school year, and also as a curious, do they get a new locker every year or do they get to keep their locker for four years? So if she's a senior, this is her fourth year with the same locker. She doesn't know the locker number. That'd be curious. Okay. She said it is her job to turn this class. She, it is her job in this class to turn on the rebel news network. And another coincidence, obviously Eric Harris's nickname is rebel or reb. For the class, Trista said she remembered the thought of the day, something to the effect of, you wished you weren't here today, and said it also contained the date of 420. Now, what's curious, the coincidence theorists always maintain that could be anything. It was a nice day out. Yeah, true. We need controls. How often does it say on the thought of the day something to that effect where you wished you weren't in school today or it's too nice to be here or whatever? How often does that come on? If they never had a thought of the day like that until this date, then it's incredibly suspicious, is it not? Also, the fact that the guy that controls the thought of the day is friends with, with Eric and Dylan. I mean, does nobody find that suspicious? I don't know. We'll get to that later. Trista describes a pattern that was on the monitor during this announcement, and she described it as being a tie-dye pattern. See, okay, that's going to be another issue, and we'll, we'll get to that shortly, because supposedly Mr. Robert Perry was wearing a tie-dye shirt, but possibly not the entire time. Now, would someone wear a shirt to shoot some people and then take off that shirt and have another shirt? Or did simply people get mixed up? Trista said she heard that Dylan Klebold and or Eric Harris had keys to gain access to the classroom where the thought of the day is produced. But that might not even be necessary because they're friends with Eric Veik. She said when she left Mr. Mosier's class, she walked down the hallway past the Columbine High Library. She advised at that time she did not see any suspicious people or items that were in the library as she passed. She then went eastbound to the main hallway to go to her class. Her gym class played football. Trista said when she was walking back to the school, she saw Steve Kernow for the last time. Trista went into the girls' locker room, got dressed, then exited the locker room, walked towards her school hallway locker. She said while en route to her locker, she stopped to talk to friends of hers in the hallway and then proceeded on. Trista said she went to her math class, and while in this class, she said she was sitting next to Tyson Knapke, who said they were closest to the door leading into the hallway. Trista said suddenly she heard the sound of several people running in the hallways outside of her classroom and said she heard people screaming. Then she heard someone yell something to the effect of, he has a gun. And Trista and Tyson Knapgate exited the classroom to see what was going on. He returned and told the teacher that everyone in class should exit the classroom and run. Trista said at this time she did not know the reason for Tyson Knapgate telling everybody to run. Trista said about this point in time, the fire alarm went off inside the school. 
It's and it's curious whether the fire alarm went off before anything happened or after, or was it simply a witness who saw a shooter with a gun and pulled the alarm so everybody would leave? I don't know. Trista said she heard noises that sounded like firecrackers going off, and she ran out of Columbine High School through the east doors across South Pier Street and into Leewood Park. Trista said she still did not know what was taking place. While running away from the high school, she did not know about the shooting incident until she arrived in Leewood Park. Trista said that she was one of the first students to get out of Columbine High School on April 20th. She said she was at the gazebo at Leewood Park about 20 minutes after arriving. She heard approximately 30 gunshots that she said were being shot in short bursts. This timeline is strange. Trista said she could hear the shots ricocheting off the gazebo. Trista said these shots began just as she had turned her back to Columbine High to talk to her friend and get something from this friend who had been standing behind her. Trista said she did not see anyone outside of Columbine High, nor did she see anyone inside the school through the windows or the door windows, through the windows or the door window shooting who may have been possibly been the shooters. Trista said she heard four or five explosions during this time frame and said to her it sounded like they were being detonated on the other side of the school, the west side, possibly outside of the cafeteria. Trista said she ran from Leewood Park after jumping over a fence and then went to Eric Long's house, who apparently lives in the neighborhood near Columbine High School. She said while running, she continued to hear booms. Trista said a short time later, she went to Chad's house, unknown last name, and went inside. She said they locked all the doors of the house due to the fact that they heard there was a suspect somewhere outside of Columbine High School in the surrounding neighborhoods that was shooting people. It was unknown where Trista received this information. Wow, that's a curiosity as well, because if there were multiple shooters and one of them never even went inside and was just running from peop- an armed shooter running from the high school, would that think that there's somebody running around the neighborhood shooting people? I showed Trista Fogarty the photographs of the duffel bag and propane tank that were later recovered in Columbine High Cafeteria. She said she did not see either of these items prior to or during the incident. Trista said she did not see anyone carrying either item or any items that may have resembled one of these items, either prior to or during the incident. I asked Trista Fogarty what she knew about the trench coat mafia and or trench coat mafia students. She said when she first began attending Columbine High, her friends advised her to avoid the trench coat mafia students. Trista said she was told the reason to avoid the trench coat mafia was that they were satanic that they use drugs together, and that they all have sex together. Trista could not elaborate further on the information she received about the Trenchcoat Mafia having sex together, but she did not believe it meant that Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris were having a homosexual relationship together. Trista Fogarty said that a friend of hers by the name of Leanne Clark was in the cafeteria April 20th when the shooting started. Trista said Clark told her that she saw who did the shooting in the cafeteria, and said that Clark identified redacted, so this is possibly Robert Perry maybe, as a gunman. Trista said she was afraid of redacted, and said that when she returned to her school classes at Chatfield High School after the shooting incident, she saw redacted at Chatfield High School, and Trista said she freaked out. Trista said the Trenchcoat Mafia students have scared her since she saw them, and said she bumped into one of them in the hallway of Columbine High School on April 20th, at approximately 9.20 outside of her English class. Trista said she pulled back and away quickly from this trench coat mafia student. However, she did not know what this student's name was. Trista Fogarty said a person she only knows as Scott said that on April 20th, he saw Eric Harris go through the custodian's roof access at Columbine High School and then go out onto the roof of the school. Trista said Scott's last name is unknown, but said he is a sophomore at Columbine High. Trista Fogarty said she believed Nicole Markham is or was Chris, Mor- Chris Morris's girlfriend. Trista said a female by the name of Jamie Thurman associates with Brooks Brown and goes over to Brooks Brown's house. She said that Jenny Neffy goes along with Jamie Thurman to Brooks Brown's house because Jenny Neffy has a crush on Brooks's Brown's brother, Ian Brown. Trista was not positive of Brooks's brother's name. However, she believed it was Ian. Trista said that Jamie Thurman told her that Brooks Brown is a nice guy. Additional information, Trista Fogarty told me that she believes that there were more than four people involved uh, in the incident on April 20th, 1999. Trista said that most of the people she has talked to believe there were more than two shooters and said that friends of hers believe that Redacted may have been one of the shooters involved on April 20th, 1999. So now we have the thoughts of the people on the ground, the students, the witnesses, the victims, friends of the victims, 
there's all these people who believe not that there were three people involved, not that there were four people involved, but more than four people. So that would obviously be five and up. Now, right or wrong, these are what the people that were there believe. Very curious. Trista Fogarty advised me that since the incident on April 20th at Columbine High School, she has had trouble dealing with the situation and, in fact, has been seeing a counsel therapist. Her mother confirmed that Trista has been seeing the therapist. I gave both of them my business card and advised them if they wish to talk with a victim's advocate in the future to contact me and make arrangements. And if she remembers anything in the future, then it may be permanent to the case. Okay. So that is her account. Very curious. No follow-up interview. So again, the coincidence theorists maintain that these are internet conspiracies and all these things. These are the thoughts of the people that were there. The witnesses, friends of the witnesses, they all believe there were more than four shooters. Or a large portion of the student body believe there's more than four shooters. So no matter how hard the coincidence theorists want to pretend and hallucinate, these theories were all formed after the fact years later as just crazy internet conspiracies, which even if that were true, that still wouldn't mean it would be wrong. But that's not the case. These are the beliefs of the people that were there. Let's move on to Timothy Castle, 3415 and onward. This is his handwritten statement, April 20th, 1999. It's about 1125. I can't tell if that's 1115 or 1125. We heard a gunshot. I remember Mr. Sanders coming through the cafeteria doors yelling, get down, get down. I heard someone get shot, so I immediately went into the cafeteria and then the teacher's lounge. Then with a few others, a teacher I didn't know, a bunch of people, about a half an hour later, they boosted me into the ceiling, and the rest stayed put. I climbed across the ceiling to the other side. It took me about five minutes to get across the room. Then from the other side, I saw someone point a gun at me, and I fell through the ceiling and ran to a cop car. So this is like right out of Die Hard here. As far as I know, the suspects are Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris, Redacted, and I think there might have been two others with them. Curious. I don't know if Redacted's Robert Perry, but the length seems to fit possibly Chris Morris. Huh, so he's climbing through the ceiling, and then from the other side, someone pointed a gun at him. Huh. So in the typewritten report, dated April 27th, this is, okay, Agent Jerry Means, Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and this, so there's a couple clarifications here. Can, so this is while they locked the bathroom door, they heard numerous noises, including loud bangs, screaming, and the sound of people running. Castle stated the sound seemed to be coming from right outside the door. Concerned that someone might be, might come in to get them. Concerned that someone might come in to get them, they began to discuss climbing up in the ceiling to hide or escape. Castle climbed up into the ceiling, then assisted Joyce Jankowski. In getting up into the suspended ceiling area, Jankowski moved to the west to an area just beyond the bathroom wall over the area of the faculty lounge. Jankowski then fell through the ceiling and into the lounge. She then scrambled back into the bathroom. Castle stated that he crawled on top of a metal heating duct and moved toward the kitchen looking for a place to hide. As he did so, he knocked several ceiling tiles off in the area of a small bathroom, which services the kitchen, and which is adjacent to the bathroom they had been hiding in. Castle then began moving west following the metal ductwork, and then moving along a metal pipe held up by some wires. As Castle reached the area of the west wall, he looked back to the area over the bathroom in the kitchen area. As he did, he observed a subject in the area whose head was just above the ceiling area. Castle said that the subject was pointing what he believed was a shotgun at him. He advised that he based this in the manner in which the subject pointed the gun at him. Castle stated that it was dark and he could not see the subject well. He described the subject as having shoulder-length dark hair. Castle stated that he believed that the subject was Dylan Klebold. Again, this is the typewritten statement after the fact. We don't know how that identification was made. He said he based this on the fact that the subject had not shot him. 
as Castle advised him he is a friend of Klebold's. Interesting. Huh. So he stated he couldn't see the figure. It was very dark, but the figure didn't shoot him. So he assumed it was Klebold because he knows Klebold, and he's a friend of his. And if that's true, that's yet another individual to be added to the list that wasn't killed by them if they spotted them. Although, Castle stated that the hair he described did not fit Klebold, and nothing about what he observed of the subject led him to his conclusion that the subject could be Klebold. What the heck? How did, that doesn't make any sense. So he believed it was Klebold based on the fact that he wasn't shot, not based on any of the way that he looked, and the hair was not consistent with Klebold's hair. Castle kicked the ceiling tiles down where he was and dropped through the ceiling. He landed in the faculty lounge next to the window through which he and others had earlier seen the bodies. Castle stated that at that time the window was intact. He then escaped the building via the door located just within the cafeteria and ran to a marked police unit on the west side. He glanced toward the cafeteria area as he ran out and did not see anyone inside. Castle stated that approximately two, one or two minutes later he saw Sean Nossam and Nick Foss and two of the teachers run out. Foss later told him that he too had gone up into the ceiling area. Castle recalled that at some point while they were in the bathroom area, Nick Foss said that one of the shooters was the kid in the next class that wore glasses, Dylan. Castle also recalled a conversation with Nate Dykeman, in which Dykeman commented that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were not at school. Dykeman told Castle that they had to be up to something as they were never gone together in the past. Castle described himself as being a friend of Dylan Klebold. He stated that he had talked to him in the previous evening and were talking about some trades involving their fantasy baseball teams. He recalled that Klebold talked about working a trade with Adam Sands for a player, Roger Clemens. And you know what else is curious? These seem to really be far from loners. I mean, Dylan Klebold, he's, in, he's doing theater... He's, he's involved in fantasy baseball. He's got all these different circles of people that he knows that aren't affiliated with other circles. I mean, I mean so did, and apparently so does Eric Harris. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy how many friends and acquaintances they have spread far and wide with different interests. Castle characterized the conversation as being very normal, as was Klebold's mood and demeanor. So that was the previous evening. Castle stated that he has known Dylan Klebold for approximately three years through school and their joint interest in fantasy baseball. Castle stated that he has had Klebold in at least one class each semester since his second semester at Columbine High School. Castle advised that there is a group of individuals who participate in this fantasy baseball league and utilize a website belonging to Chad Laughlin. Castle advised that the internet... Okay, address for the site. Okay... Castle stated he talked to Klebold on a daily basis and currently had a class with him in fourth hour. They are both involved in video production. Castle stated he has heard media accounts about videos that Klebold allegedly made which depicted events similar to what occurred at Columbine High School on April 20th. Castle stated that he never saw any such video. Castle stated he is not a member of the group which has come to be known as the Trenchcoat Mafia but has another friend who is named Nate. Dykeman. Castle stated that Dykeman worked with Eric Harris and Klebold at Blackjack Pizza, and that Dykeman was Klebold's best friend until Dykeman became involved with Christy Epling. Castle stated that he had Eric Harris in his fifth hour class and also spoke to him almost every morning. Castle advised that Harris kept to himself and recalled Harris being upset about not having a prom date. Castle was asked about Klebold's hobbies and interests. He stated that Klebold was into hard punk music like Marilyn Manson and the German rock band KMFDM. Klebold was also a Red Sox fan and a Roger Clemens fan. Castle stated that Klebold was a good guy and that what took place was definitely out of character for him. It's a weird way to put it. Castle stated that he has never been to Klebold's residence. He has never heard him discuss anything about guns, bombs, or mention things like the Anarchist Cookbook. Castle recalled Nate Dykeman telling him that Harrison Klebold never made it to their bowling class on the morning of the shooting. Chad Laughlin also told him that as he was leaving campus and Klebold was arriving, Laughlin flipped off Klebold in the parking lot. Castle stated that he was interviewed on 2020 at his residence. He said that while the crew was there, he overheard a female crew member stating that Redacted had brought a duffel bag to the school. 
he did not know who the female crew member was. So the 2020 crew has apparently some insider info as well, discussing that there's another individual bringing duffel bags to the school. And we'll get into sightings with, with plenty of other individuals who saw people bringing bags into the school. And the follow-up interview, there's really not much more gone into. This follow-up interview, May 6th, 1999. So there is another there is another piece of info here that's that's interesting. Tim stated that Nate Dykeman was his best friend and that he had called and talked to Nate in Land of Lakes, Florida last night, which was May 5th. Tim stated that Nate had been very close with both Eric Harris and Dylan, but had recently gotten a new girlfriend by the name of Christy Epling, who, along with his job at the Firestone at the Firestone store located at Pierce and Elmhurst, had kept Nate occupied and busy. In asking what Nate had talked about in their phone conversation last night, Tim stated that Nate thought that Eric and Dylan had probably carried their bombs into the school during a two-hour block of time that they disappeared from the after-prom party at the school. Tim himself was at the after-prom party along with his mother, Kim, who acted as a chaperone. Tim said that he didn't realize that both Eric and Dylan had left from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m., but that he did talk to Dylan at about 4 a.m. about boxing with five-pound gloves in a game that had been set up for the students. They decided not to box and then went separate ways. Tim stated that Nate had told him both Eric and Dylan had disappeared from the party between 2 and 4, and that was his theory of when they may have carried the materials into the school and hid them. When Detective Demmel asked Timothy if Nate Dykeman had any prior knowledge that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were going to do something, Tim replied that Nate had said he knew they were going to do something, but that he did not know they were going to do what they did. So he's admitting here that Nate said he knew they were going to do something. Now, now, I mean, he ha he needs to he needs to expand on that because because what does that mean? So now's a good opportunity to read this article from the Denver Post. This is a this was published April 24th. So just a couple days later, officials think bombs at the Columbine High School were planted during prom. 150 federal, state, and local crime investigators gathered for a meeting to evaluate the evidence in the case. By Marilyn Robinson, Mark Obmasek, and Peggy Lau, April 24th, 1999. As 150 investigators swapped leads in their hunt for new suspects, authorities speculated Friday the two teenagers the two teenage killers could have planted their homemade bombs during Columbine High's after prom party last Saturday night. So if that's true, that means the bombs were all sitting there undetected. So Sunday, okay, there's probably not a lot of people in the school, if any, on Sunday. But all through Monday, all through Monday classes, they were sitting there the whole time? I don't know. Maybe. Let's see what the rest of the article says. If they wanted to plant explosives, they could have done it then. They would have had access to the school during the after-hour prom party that they attended, Jefferson County Sheriff's Lieutenant John Keekbush told the Denver Post. Meanwhile, authorities said they haven't identified a third suspect, but they believe Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold had help in plotting and carrying out Tuesday's schoolhouse murders. There's plenty of indications from the witness interviews that there are other people who had who very likely had knowledge of this and may have had some degree of involvement short of another gunman, Kike Bush said. We don't know if there's a third gunman, but we're not discounting it. Jefferson County officials had a discovery of at least 30 bombs, so I believe the final tally was over 100, possibly even close to 200, including a powerful 20-pound device found in the kitchen Thursday suggested the two killers were assisted in their rampage that killed 15, hospitalized 22, and shocked the world. It was one of the deadliest school shootings in U.S. history. Just how the killers smuggled in their mass arsenal is another aspect of investigators' work, and speculation arose Friday that Harris and Klebold had obtained school keys. But Kike Bush said, we have nothing definitive to indicate they had keys. We're going to try to check out the keys, one of the thousands of things we need to check into, he said. Since Tuesday, several students have talked of a third suspect, a lot more than several. The role of another possible suspect was obscured further by the release 
Friday of 911 tapes from the murders. Though many witnesses said Harris and Klebold wore black trench coat during their killing spree, the 911 tape released Friday shows one of the first police officers on the scene reporting a shooter who had a white t-shirt on with some kind of a holster vest or something. It's unclear whether the two identified killers changed clothes or took off their trench coats during the rampage. The 911 tapes offered the first public look at the panic, agony, and sheer terror of the high school attack. The most harrowing account came from an unidentified teacher trying to protect students huddled in the library. He's upstairs, he's right outside of here, he's outside the hall, the teacher pleaded to a police emergency dispatcher. Kids, just stay down. Police still, still have no motive for the killings, but students say Klebold and Harris yelled they were seeking revenge for being teased and insulted. Governor Bill Owens toured the school Thursday night and emerged visibly shaken. It was a scene of devastation, Owens said Friday. I went into the library and I never want to see a room like that in my life. The destruction and damage throughout the area of the school where this occurred was stunning. The explosion in the cafeteria was so hot it melted the ceiling tiles, but nobody was killed in the cafeteria. The reason is the teachers got them out. It gave them that split second. Columbine students will return to the classroom Thursday, taking half-day courses at Crosstown rival Chatfield High School. Also Friday, 150 federal, state, local crime investigators gathered for all-day meeting to evaluate evidence in the case. In the three days since the murders, more than 500 interviews have been conducted. Though a lack of coordination had investigators questioning some people two or three times, officials said. Meanwhile, prosecutors and law enforcement agents went to court to try to keep secret at least three search warrants and affidavits in the case. The affidavits contained the name of witnesses and acquaintances of the two murderers and some maybe accomplices who helped plot and carry out the rampage, officials argued. Confusions from such a massive investigation also led police to make several inaccurate statements later retracted about the crime, including the number of people killed in the attack and the number of bombs found by investigators Thursday. Or were those initial numbers accurate? Were there people who were killed who were not students? Either other trench coat mafia members, possibly, from other areas? Possibly law enforcement? Or possibly just other individuals they didn't want anybody to know about? Or were the bodies in the hallways simply people playing dead? Although I haven't seen any of those witness statements that people were specifically playing dead in the hallway, uh, in the stairway areas where supposedly nobody was shot. Now here's a couple, okay, let's, it's, it's about to get even more mind shocking here. So confusion, okay, on Friday, Jeffco spokesman Steve Davis corrected a police statement from the previous day about security camera coverage at the school. Police now say there was no video camera in the library where most mo murders took place. Still, police said they had recovered tape from cameras in the rest of the school. How many cameras? How many cameras? And again, was that, was it originally accurate? Apparently, I mean, I'll, I'll probably do a dedicated episode just on the cameras and the camera footage. Apparently, there was there was a camera outside the library, not necessarily in the library. There was a camera in the library, somewhere in the library area. And I believe even DeAngelis mentioned that, the principal. So you would think the principal would know where the cameras were. But either way, continuing here, he said he recovered tape from cameras in the rest of the school. He does not give an amount of cameras here, though. Kate Bush said the tapes will be sent to FBI headquarters in Quantico to enhance before investigators review them. We don't want to do anything to compromise those tapes. We have no idea what they're going to show. Ideally, they would show the movement and also the actual placement, perhaps, of some of the explosive devices prior to the incident. If that's the case, we have just got very important evidence. Okay, then they talk about tracing the guns. Okay, so very curious regarding when they planted those or if they had help in planting those. So let's go on now to Alicia Mays, 3613 to 3619. No handwritten statement. This is a report from May 3rd regarding a May 1st interview. Investigator Lauk from Jeffco, DA's office. Alicia said she had been in the area known as the Rebel Corner which is by the southeast doors. 
Alicia stated that she arrived in the cafeteria at approximately 11.15 a.m. after her fourth hour class. She and Crystal were talking, looking through a window, which gave her view outside to the west. She said she saw a male subject trying to hold up a girl. She said it looked to her like he was standing up and the girl in his arms was on her knees. Alicia stated that she then ran out the doors closer to her and ran west to about the corner of the building. She stated that she observed a male dressed in black pants, white shirt, care, uh, wearing a black hat backwards and a black trench coat. She is advised that this subject was walking down a hill. She said she saw him reach into his coat and saw him throw an object into the parking lot. She said she heard an explosion and watched the subject walk toward the soccer field. She stated that she then ran back into the cafeteria by way of a southwest door. She advised that she may have yelled something about a bomb as she ran back to the Rebel Corn area. She stated many of the students were on the floor at this point. She said that she ran down the foreign language hall east of the Rebel Corner. She ran out a door and continued to run to Pierce Street. Alicia stated that when she first observed the male in the black trench coat, she thought it was a person known to her as redacted. She advised that now, after seeing pictures of Dylan Klebold, she believes that this person may have been him, not Redacted. She stated that she has never spoken to Eric or Dylan or Redacted. She advised that her friend Crystal Archuleta had told her of seeing a tan pickup truck circling the parking lot prior to the initial explosion. I don't think we went over that before. A tan pickup truck circling the parking lot prior to the initial explosion. Curious. So, she's not sure. The only reason she thinks it might have been Dylan is because she was shown pictures after that. Because she stated that as she first observed the male, she said it was redacted who she did know, and she did not know Dylan. So, not 100% in either direction. Obviously, the coincidence theorists claim that the mistake in, in witness reliability only works in one direction if it supports the official narrative. Now, what's curious, what's curious is that the following report, I mean, and we don't have her own words here. We have these investigators typing up reports for, you know, to meet their own agendas here, but... This was May 19th. Mays had a follow-up interview, said there was a commotion outside. Now here's what's curious. She recalled seeing a tan-colored, possibly 1980s, beat-up compact pickup truck driving around in the parking lot briefly, then drove from the lot, turning possibly to the right, leaving the area. Did they ever track that truck down? Okay. She said at this point she looked at the area at the top of the exterior stairs in the west side cafeteria, saw a suspect she thought was student redacted. So again, is this Robert Perry? She clarified that this could have been D Dylan Klebold as she did not know either one of them prior to the shooting. However, if you recall, in the previous report she, we, uh, we just read, she thought it was a person known to her as redacted. So is this the second investigator trying to make it look like she can't identify either way? She, apparently, she said she, if this is Robert Perry she's talking about, she did know him. A student known to her. Now in this follow-up report, all of a sudden it's stating that neither redacted or Dylan Klebold, she did not know either one of them prior to the shooting. So how would she know it was redacted if she didn't know him? <laughs> And no follow-up. It says no new leads generated. So 1980s tan pickup, beat up tan pickup. Was that ever tracked down? Who owns such a vehicle? Possibly other trench coat mafia members. All right, let's move on to Luke Milne, 5622 to 5625. And no handwritten statement. This is dated here, document June 9th. Investigator Reeker did interview with Luke Milne at his residence with his mother present. He was in the tech lab at approximately 11 a.m., went to the commons area for a coke, and at that time he observed Redacted in the commons area talking to some friends and that he knows Redacted from the Safeway store and from school. Milne states that Redacted was wearing a black trench coat, white shirt, black pants, no hat, no glasses, black boots, and black hair. Milne did not talk to Redacted at that time, 
and that Redacted did not have anything in his hands. Milne stated that Dan Goen, Brandon Little, and Bijan Monte all saw Redacted shooting at the school. Milne was in the cafeteria at 7.30 and did not see anything unusual at the time. He was unable to provide further info and the interview was terminated. So he observed Redacted in the commons area talking to some friends. Okay, curious. And he said he had nothing in his hands at the time he observed him. Now, so he didn't see this individual shooting. He simply observed the individual, but apparently Robert Perry wasn't there that day. <laughs> so either way, even if he's not involved, he also listed three individuals who saw redacted shooting, even though he himself did not. This is, of course, Dan Goen, Brandon Little, Bijan Monte. And let's go over Brandon Little's account before we finish up with Luke Milne. Actually, let's finish Luke Milne first. So, follow-up interview, October 18th, Investigator Reeker. Saw male party, all black clothes, white male, approximately 6'3 in height. <laughs> Dark brown hair, no hat, no glasses. And again, we don't know how much the investigators are adding here in their typed up report versus what they were stated. Milne stated he did not know Harris or Klebold. Prior to the shooting, he had gone from the tech room to the commons area of the cafeteria to get a Coke and had seen a person he felt to be redacted in the common area. And then Milne went back to tech class and the shooting started moments later. Milne was advised by investigator Reeker that Redacted was at his home during the shooting. And Milne was shown a picture of Dylan Klebold in the cafeteria. And Milne stated that this was the person he saw in the hallway loading the weapon. And he also remarked that Klebold and Redacted look alike. So that's all she wrote there. They look alike. Impossible to make an ID. I guess he wasn't close enough to see the acne. All right, let's go to Brandon Little's account, document 6793. This one is curious. Report date, April 28th. And they forgot to redact Robert Perry here. <laughs> In this document, this is Columbine High School Task Force. This lead was Brandon had information referencing Robert Perry involved in the shooting, told the source he saw Robert Perry in the school with a gun. So May 10th, 1999, Brandon was met at his residence. He was interviewed about the information he provided to Deputy Warren. The only information he disclosed was about what he was hearing from other students. He was told by Luke Milne and told by Bijan Monte she saw redacted in the cafeteria shooting and she is afraid to go to school as she knows she saw him there shooting. Brandon was asked about his whereabouts during the incident. So right or wrong, Bijan Monte is terrified to go back to school because she truly believes she saw redacted shooting people. And she doesn't want to go to school with Redacted. That's curious. That's curious. That's her conviction. That is her conviction. And again, she could be wrong, but she was there. I wasn't. I know all the coincidence theorists and the Dunning-Kruger goofs criticizing her were not. Or at least that are criticizing her online. I don't know if the other students that were there are criticizing her or telling her she didn't see what she saw. Because some of them also saw the same thing she saw. Brandon was asked about his whereabouts during the incident. He has fourth hour off. Okay. He took some friends to the subway for lunch. He was with Holly Perdue, Aaron Lawson. He had only met Holly a day or so before. They all left early for lunch, then returned to look at some pictures. When they got close, they noticed the problems, picked up one other friend by the name of Pat. Then they drove over to the Leewood Elementary School to warn them of the problem and not let the kids there out. All of Brandon's friends have been talking about how there are more than the two shooters in the school. This is based upon how they were seen in various areas of the school. They have taken various diagrams from the newspaper and tried to show in relation to the information they have as to where the shooters were. It is all not logical for two shooters to be in the locations they were. And I'm, 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 I'm guessing here that's that there were two shooters spotted in one area one shooter spotted another area, and then another one or two sh shooters spotted upstairs. So, I, again, is it possible they switched positions, etc.? But then there's people that saw three individuals at once. There's even people that saw four individuals at once. And that's it. No follow-up, no nothing. That's all we have from Brandon Little.
but again, the sentiment is clear among what a, a certain portion of the student body believes. Did we go over Lorenz's account? I don't think we did. She might not even be listed. I mean, there's just so many accounts to go over here. Document 6797. Stephanie Lorenz was interviewed April 30th by investigator Jill Rudler, Colorado State Patrol. Miss Lorenz stated she was not in the school at the time of the shooting. She was in the front of the public library at 2.30 p.m. after the shooting. And she was looking for friends. She said she saw three people all dressed in black, probably all males. She said she wasn't sure if they were laughing or not. One was tall, maybe 6'2", with a blonde ponytail and wearing black combat boots. The others were shorter. She couldn't describe them. Does that sound like uh, Joe Stare? I mean, that's not damning in any way, but just curious what the movements were of all these individuals, obviously. And of course, we already went over Liam Murphy's account, very damning. So this is, she, she also picked out Joe Stare. Let's go to Mark Opfer. We have his handwritten statement, Denver Police Department, April 20th, 230 was going outside to write a report at 11.30 a.m., saw a male, black trench coat, 5'7", black, what is that, boots, shoes, I can't tell what that is, unknown, no, unknown shoes, what is that, black hair, unknown shoes, was wearing a mask. That's suspect number one. Suspect number two, white male, black trench coat, black hat, red bill with a large B on the front, Wearing black pants, 6'3 to 6'4, Mark saw the shooter of the two shooting, the shorter of the two shooting. Mark saw the shooter and shot the one victim who went, had uh, heard explosions, like shotguns, maybe grenades. Heard 8 to 10 explosions. Okay, this is actually, that's a, this is a summary of the statement, so this is actually... Dan Wyckoff, I guess, he's writing this from what Mark told him. So the FBI report here, April 28th, 99. Opfer is a freshman. He went to lunch, cafeteria, 11.15, April 20th, 99. After eating, went outside the cafeteria by himself. At around 11.30, began walking up toward the library of the outside of the staircase, located on the northwest side of the cafeteria. He was walking next to Daniel Robau and saw two white males at the top of the stairs, one of whom was holding what he thought was a water squirt gun. Opfer did not recognize either of these individuals, both wearing all black, black trench coats. One was about 6'4", and was wearing a backwards black hat with a B emblem on it. He had no weapon visible. The other person was about 5'8", had a large pistol in his hands. Opfer identified it as the Tech 9 assault pistol he has seen a picture of in the newspaper reporting. The shorter person began firing the pistol down the stairs. So that's curious because officially Dylan is the one with the Tech 9, unless they switched guns randomly. But he said the shorter person was firing a Tech 9 down the stairs. Opfer turned to speak to Raubauer, who then looked at him strangely and fell down screaming. Opfer realized Raubauer had been shot, and so he ran down the stairs and into the southwest entrance of the cafeteria. Inside, he told the janitor and other students to get out because someone was shooting at other students. He then ran east to the hallway on the south side of the auditorium and then south down the foreign language area hallway, warning other students and faculty about the shooter. I mean, this kid's a freshman, and he's running around warning people instead of just leaving himself. Opfer and several teachers and students hid in a classroom for about three hours, left the school about an hour after they heard the last gunshots and explosions. Opfer has heard about the Trenchcoat Mafia, but only knows two members of the group, Joe Stare, Columbine student who graduated last year, and Chris Morris. At the time, Opfer believed the taller person in the trench coat who was with the shooter was redacted. Since Redacted is about the same height and build and always wears a black trench coat and a black beret. So is he saying he saw Chris Morris? Huh. So he doesn't really mention the hair much? And no further follow-ups. So make of that what you will. Next up we have Laura Hornbaker's account, document 1939. 
And she said she heard from friends that Josh Ortwine witnessed the shooting and he was telling everyone he saw Redacted shooting a gun. And curiously, Josh Ortwine's account seems to be missing from all of the documentation. Let's go to Brie Pasquale. This is a very, very damning account here. Document 18018. Actually, it starts a little earlier. Document 18017. Rita Lensex. Information received date April 23rd. Rita Lensex states her sister, Marge Hendry, told her the girl that was on CNN that said that a shooter named Redacted pointed his gun at her, but recognized her and didn't shoot. Redacted lives down the street from her. So a student who she knows, who lives right down the street, that's who she identified. But apparently the coincidence theorists say she's mistaken. Marge said that she saw Brie Pasquale on CNN and that the shooter was named Redacted. So Brie Pasquale's account is, is very long, actually, very tragic. I mean, she saw people get killed in the library. Eric Harris talked to her, pointed the gun at her, asked her if she wanted to die. I mean, it's all just absolutely just incredibly horrific just to read the account. What's curious, though, is that she didn't know either one of them, and the investigator actually had to correct her because she was saying it was Klebold, and, and the investigator wanted her to clarify that she didn't actually know Klebold, and she said no. So it was after seeing the media on him. And also there's a long redacted line regarding what Dylan Klebold said after the police arrived. Is it possible he's referencing other shooters by name or whatever, who knows, it's just a long redacted line of what she heard Dylan Klebold say. And again, it's unclear what she really believes. Was it really just an error in communication regarding the lead sheet? Possibly, possibly, who knows? Or did someone mistake, mistake her? Huh. But apparently, yeah, there's something off about this lead sheet because it's someone who lives down the street from her so it may be she, this individual, she said the girl that was on TV, if that wasn't Brie Pasquale, that's someone else who says the gunman lived down the street for her. Here's another curious comment. I don't know that this possibly could be something lost in translation, but uh, the date is April 29th, interview with Emily Wyant. Sophomore, she was in the library. So she arrived 10.45, approximately 11, 10 a.m. after she heard the gunshots. Female teacher came into the library yelling for everyone to get down. Okay. Miss Wyant stated you could hear the gunshots getting closer. The two gunmen entered the library through the library's main entrance. She stated she had never seen either one of the gunmen before, although she would recognize them if she saw them again. So is it possible she watched zero news reports and was not aware that Harris and Klebold were identified as the shooters on April 29th, nine days later? I mean, I don't know what to make of this because she's saying if she saw them again, she'd be able to recognize them. So did she not realize that they were already identified or is she talking about gunmen other than Harris and Klebold? She described gunman number one wearing a black trench coat, tall, long brown hair. Gunman number two did not have a coat. He was wearing a white t-shirt, black pants. Both had guns. She did not know what kind. And then she just constantly refers to them as gunmen. Why is she mentioning she'd recognize them if she saw them again? So does that mean she has not seen them identified? She was not given any pictures of them? in this interview, like with other interviews for photo lineups. I mean, I don't understand that at all. But that's that's the case. That's the case against Perry, more or less. So... She was also not the, other, the only one. Lisa Forgan apparently said the same thing. And Arthur Curtis, 3,005, 19,444, respectively. Wow, this is getting crazy, because now we have all these library witnesses saying that they would recognize the pictures of Harrison Klebold, or if it was them, 
Okay, this is this is getting really mind shocking now. I don't, I don't know what to make of this. Let's uh let's go to Aaron Welsh, six ten. One step at a time here. Document six ten. This report is the twenty second of April. Okay. I don't know, maybe these are just errors in communication, but let's let's examine here. Welsh advised he was in the library when Klebold and Harris came into the room. Welsh observed the two suspects shoot several students. Again, is this investigator writing this? Because he thinks it's Harold, Klebold and Harris, and Welsh didn't actually state it was Klebold and Harris. The investigator is simply writing that down because he believes it's Klebold and Harris. Welsh observed two suspects shoot several students and make racial statements. Harris observed a shotgun rifle and handgun and observed two bomb explosions welsh describes two other persons who claim to be in the so-called trench coat mafia these two were not observed april 20th redacted and redacted unsure of last name welsh can identify both suspects and can give good accounts of the situation so does that mean he could identify dylan and eric clearly is that what that means it's very possible that's what that means. Again, it would it would help to have his handwritten statement here. Yes, I'm assuming that's just people Star Viego didn't read that correct. Now here's here's a lot more problems. Hillary Snyder, Rachel Danford, and Janelle Feibolt saw redacted in school on April twentieth. He was wearing a tie dye shirt. Rachel later sees redacted down at the Columbine Public Library. So they saw him in the school, then at the library. According to Perry, if this is Perry, he was home. He didn't go. He was. He's no longer a student at the school. So why would he be at the school? So I don't believe anybody's contesting he was at the library. Is that where he said he went to pick up his sister? But let's look at Terry Lawson, ten thousand twenty, actually ten thousand twenty-two. Witness statement: Terry Lawson reports he was in a in the cafeteria saw. A senior he believed to be redacted with a backpack and a black trench coat holding a handgun. Is this Robert Perry? No follow-up there, so that's all we have there. His account is on 3530 and onward. So the investigator is stating in this report that he saw Dylan Klebold. So is that what he said, though? Or is this the investigator just referencing Klebold? As, okay, as, yeah, that's weird. Lawson described Klebold as 6'5 to 6'7. So again, this looks like the investigator put down Klebold instead of suspect because the investigator thought it was Klebold. Klebold's obviously not between 6'5 and 6'7. Obviously, that's closer to Robert Perry, Chris, Chris Morris height. Skinny, blonde hair, collar length, although I don't know, maybe that is closer to Dylan Klebold. Wearing an ankle-length trench coat button, buttoned up. Wearing a baseball-style cap backwards. Red emblem in the front, worn correctly. So, Bill forward. Black backpack worn on Klebold's back, nothing covering his face. Huh. Weird. Very, very weird. Let's go to Monica Shuster. 19,470. Very curious, so dated here, April 29th, 99, time 11.30 a.m. Shuster was with Robin Anderson on April 20th. They left school at 11.10 a.m., convenient time, with Tammy Golden to go to Dairy Queen. Returned to school at 11.25 a.m. Anderson pulled into senior parking lot and heard gunfire. They stayed in parking lot until 3 p.m. Shuster saw the gunman but did not believe it was Harris or Klebold. Shuster believes Anderson knew about the shooting because she bought them the guns. Per Shuster, Anderson was not acting herself prior to leaving the school to go to Dairy Queen because urgent to leave the school and wanted to stay at Dairy Queen. And we'll get into that later. But, wow, okay, so Shuster saw the gunman, did not believe it was Harris or Klebold. Again, this is not definitive by any stretch of the imagination. If this is all we had, then there'd be nothing to discuss. But we have absolute positive IDs, which is what's making this so curious and problematic. Lisa Forgan, 3004 and onward. 
So again, this is curious. So this report is dated April 22nd regarding the April 22nd telephone uh, conversation. So telephone witness Sandra Inman, due to the fact she had called Sheriff's Office stating she had info concerning Columbine High School shootings. Witness Inman stated that she had a student named Lisa Forgan who had told her she was in the cafeteria the entire time the incident was occurring and that Forgan was hiding under a table when two armed suspects entered the cafeteria. Witness Inman said she was told by Forgan that these individuals were not wearing trench coats. She described the individuals as one having long blonde hair, is this Joe Stare, and an orange shirt and the other individual having blonde hair. Witness Inman states she believes Forgan told her that possibly she could ID these individuals if she could look through a yearbook and those photos were in there. Okay, so April 22nd, so two days after the shooting, a call comes in 2.45 p.m. Sandra Inman is calling the sheriff's office stating that one of her students named Lisa Forgan saw two shooters in the cafeteria and she can ID them. Well, Eric and Dylan were ID day of. I mean, if you want to say some people didn't get around to seeing the reports until the day after, that's fine. It's plastered all over the news. Why would two days later, on April 22nd at 2.45 p.m., a witness is frantically calling the sheriff's office to provide more information on two additional shooters? So this is her handwritten... Uh, this is her... This looks like her handwritten statement. Looks like they got to her the 29th. My friends and I were in the cafeteria when janitor came running in, telling everyone to get down. I saw one of the gunmen near the stairs running north and the west along serving line to the teacher's conference room. He was shooting a gun and throwing pipe bombs, four or five total. I saw the second gunman appear near the bottom of the stairs and he was firing in the air towards others in the cafeteria. First gunman kept running back and forth in front of service line. First gunman returned to the teacher's conference room and started shooting. I heard a small explosion and something, gas and some more gunfire and an explosion and a ball of fire near the service area. The three of us got up and ran out the south door to the parking lot, took cover behind a brown car. We were in the parking lot for an hour or two before an officer escorted us out. We were in the cafeteria for about on, does that say an hour? I can't see what that says. Okay, first gunman, white male, 5'5", five, five. slim, blue baseball cap, orange t-shirt, orange, orange t-shirt. So, and I also believe she's not the only one that said there was an orange t-shirt. Shaggy blonde hair sticking out of cap. So again, she's stating he was 5'5 five, five here. Five, five shaggy hair st uh, sticking out of the cap. Would Dylan Klebold be mistaken for somebody who's five, five? I mean, this guy's six foot three. Okay, uh, narrow face. Spoke German. Second gunman, white male, tall and thin, long blonde hair. Okay, so I guess the first gunman she might be Dylan. Uh, I guess Eric Harris, would he be described as five, five if he's five, eight, five, nine? But he wasn't wearing an orange shirt, though, and he didn't have shaggy blonde hair sticking out of his cap. The second gunman, white male, tall and thin, long blonde hair. Huh. Not shaggy, curly hair. Okay. May be able to identify the first gunman, but not the second. Curious. This is dated April 29th. So, <laughs> despite all the news reports of the identification of both Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, She's stating that she might be able to identify this first gunman. It looks like she made a typewritten statement, too. Yeah, this looks like a typewritten statement. And a couple other things here. Okay, so... I saw the first gunman, medium-sized, narrow face, orange t-shirt, blue cap. Hair was shaggy, curly blonde. He kept throwing pipe bombs across the room. This guy also kept getting closer to us. I heard what may have been the janitor yell at the man to put the gun down. She's also calling these gunmen men instead of, I don't know, kid, teen, student. 
shooter. The gunman yelled something back in German. I heard gunshots and the cooks scream. Okay, then they ran away. Wow, this is actually really dark here. We ran to the fence, ran out toward the track field. A cop searched each of us to make sure that we didn't have any weapons. We were brought to a safe area around the corner of the street. A cop talked to me, and I knew that he wasn't really caring about what I saw. I mean, that's just sad, though. I mean, the trauma that these kids went through, and for them, even if the cop did care, he caused the appearance that he didn't, and it's kind of sad. So what's curious, so when she's as answering the questionnaire, Team 4 interview guideline, minimal questions to be asked, did you see Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold either Monday and Tuesday? It's not stating that they were the shooters. She simply writes, don't know them. Regarding Trenchcoat Mafia questions, she said she knows Brian from World of Work class or something like that. I can't tell what that says. Now what's curious here, who knows what was said, but... This follow-up report is September 27th dated, and that is the date that this follow-up interview occurred. And, okay, so she was shown photographs of Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris. So is this on the 27th in September? So she didn't look at any, she didn't see a single news broadcast or talk to anybody so she was shown photographs of Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris in the cafeteria area. Forgan pointed the photograph of Dylan Klebold and stated, that's the guy I saw. She stated also that the gun Klebold was carrying was the same gun she described. She pointed to Eric Harris, stated this was in fact the other person she saw during the incident. So here's an interesting curiosity. Forgan advised me that she had her face buried in her arms during part of the incident in the cafeteria, and after seeing the photographs and discussing the incident with me, she advised that she thought the gunman had come down into the cafeteria sooner than she than they actually did. So again, that she was re was she re-educated into these answers, and why did her initial account vary so widely? And did she really not look at any media? Did she really not know that the shooters were identified? Because why is she offering to ID them? It's just weird. Really, really weird. Let's go to Casey Rugseger, another library witness. Let's see what she has to say. And she was actually injured. She had a gunshot grazed to back of the neck, shotgun wound to right shoulders, through and through C-shaped shrapnel wound to the right hand, Entered near base of thumb, exited through back of thumb, metal washer lodged in shrapnel wound. And of course, very, very tragic. Document 118 onward. Okay, at the request of Lakewood Sergeant Don Grishin, I.O. asked Rugseger whether she knows someone named Redacted, a white male with curly hair, possibly Robert Perry. She advised that the name sounds familiar, but she did not recall knowing him. Okay... She does remember hearing somebody say that there was somebody on the roof. This is when she's outside behind the police car. Okay, now here's the money statement. Rugseger has never seen Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold before. Rugseger did not recognize the pictures of Harris and Klebold she had seen in the media as the gunman in the library. Let me say that again. Rugseger did not recognize the pictures of Harris and Klebold she has seen in the media as the gunman in the library. I mean, what can you make of that? I mean, I don't know what to make of that. Sure, they don't. nobody looks exactly the same as yearbook pictures or whatever, but she, she did not recognize them? I don't know. So that's what we have on Robert Perry. I mean, just, it's curious. There's another reference to a guy in a tie-dye shirt, which is Patrick Curso, 8793, which is curious. Patrick Michael Curso. Patrick advised investigators he saw the gunman. Patrick also related that Chris Markham's sister dates of the people in the gang. His sister is identified as Nicole Markham. Patrick stated he was in the commons area. It started outside. He saw a kid in a trench coat. He had a plastic bag with him. The person then threw something in the parking lot. Patrick related he saw the gunman shoot one of the kids in the knee. The gunman was five to six feet away from the victim. The person who was shot was Austin Eubanks. The trash bag the shooter had was black in color. Patrick related when the shooter went inside, he saw his face. 
He described the shooter as 165 pounds, six foot three, senior at the school, no glasses, dark brown hair, black trench coat, pink tie-dye type shirt, possibly yellow. Now, even if you have a fog of war situation, would you mistake a black shirt for a yellow or and or pink tie-dye shirt? I mean, maybe you might mistake it for dark blue, dark gray. Would you mistake it for a pink tie-dye shirt, possibly yellow, yellow and pink mix, tie-dye? Hmm. Patrick related there were five to ten kids in the group. Patrick related they previously said they were going to take over the school. Huh. Curious. Very, very curious. From the Denver Dispatch Tapes transcript, we've got a possible suspect somebody wants just left the library. A white male in a tie-dye t-shirt. Unknown what he's wanted for, but I got that from 5A Dispatch. Man in a multicolor shirt, possible suspect. Information from 490, 490, any other description, 1309. Brian Cook, document 6276, saw Perry in Clement Park Library on April 20th with several individuals, including Pauline Colby. He was wearing a tie-dye shirt and a black baseball cap. So how popular are tie-dye shirts? I mean, I don't know. And Perry was supposedly never at the school, let alone with a gun, so I don't know. Andrea Cook, 5189, talked to Robert Perry at Clement Park Library afternoon, April 20th. He was wearing a tie-dye shirt and no trench coat. Suny Hop, 1936, saw Robert Perry walking from the direction of Columbine to the Clement Park Library on April 20th after the shooting. He wore a tie-dye shirt and a black baseball cap backwards. She'd known him for six years and was 100% sure that it was he. Let's look at that. 1936. Sunny Hop or Hope. H-O-P-P. -P. May 12th, investigators spoke to the subject. Sunny was in school at Columbine day of the incident. Within two hours after the incident began, Sonny was at the public library in Clement Park and saw Redacted walking from the vicinity of the lake behind the library toward the front of the library. Sonny stated she could not give an exact time because she had lost all concept of time that day. Based on the direction that Redacted was walking, Sonny assumed he had come from Columbine High School and thought that was unusual because he is not a student there anymore. So apparently she's talking about Perry here. Sonny described the clothing that Perry was wearing as black pants, a tie-dye shirt, and a black baseball cap turned backwards. When Sonny asked if she saw any logos on Redacta's hat, she stated that she did not recall seeing a logo that day. Although Redacted usually wears a black baseball cap with a white Jägermeister logo on it. Sonny did not speak to Redacted that day, but stated that she has known Redacted for about six years and is 100% sure that it was he. Sonny did not see Redacted at any other time on that date. What does everybody make of that? Let's look at Andrea Cook, document 5188, June 3rd. Report date regarding, okay, this lead sheet. Andrea Cook indicates in her letter that she was acquainted with Redacted and stated in the letter that he knew about the attack that was going to take place at Columbine High School before it occurred. Attached to the lead control sheet, also the original letter written by Andrea Cook to Mrs. Lucas. The fourth paragraph on this one-page handwritten letter write, reads the following. Even what happened at Columbine will not discourage me. I will always have fond memories there. It was the first place where I did not get teased as much. I guess I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for the fire alarm. I was in my food class at the time. My friends told me a bomb exploded close to the room. I'm thankful I'm alive, but mad. I just found out Redacted helped get the guns. At least he turned himself in. I knew him. I went to a dance with him. He told me right after this happened at Columbine, he knew they were going to do it. I asked him why he did not tell. He said he wasn't sure. 
And so they forgot to black out Robert Perry, looks like one point later in the document. So I'm assuming this is constantly they're talking about Robert Perry here. And so she just found out Robert Perry helped them get the guns. I mean, the plot thickens. And he turned himself in. So are all these rumors early on that he turned himself in, are they accurate? And did he have some kind of plea deal immunity? And is this why this is such a big mess? Because they felt like they couldn't get all the info they needed without giving him immunity, so they gave him immunity, and he really was a shooter. And then that's what caused all these issues. Or at the very least, he was there, even if not a shooter. Even if some people are even there with a gun and not a shooter. I mean, who knows? There's a lot of combinations. I went out to a dance with him. He told, okay, so he said he wasn't sure why he didn't tell him them. On May 19th, investigative officer met with Andrea Christine Cook at her residence. In discussing the shooting deaths at Columbine High, she advised that at 11.30, she was in food class. Fire alarm went off. She stated that her fellow classmates went to the exit. She exited the school with her initially ending up by the tennis courts. She stated that during this time, she did not know what was taking place until she had heard an explosion and two gunshots. So I.O. then showed Andrea Cook the handwritten letter addressed to Mrs. Lucas, signed by her, with her confirming that she did write the letter on May 12th, 1999. She further advised I.O. that she knew redacted, and that she had only one date with him. She stated that the two of them attended a dance at Columbine High December 98, with this dance being a formal occasion. She then showed Io a photograph taken of Robert Perry and her in formal attire at this dance. After this date, she stated that redacted asked her if they could be more serious, with her stating she did not want to become more serious and just wanted to remain friends. She told him that she only went to this dance with him as a friend and nothing more, and apparently this did not greatly upset him, since they still talked in a friendly manner after this dance date. Io then analyzed the fourth paragraph in this handwritten letter by Andrea Cook, asked her at the time to explain the sentence, I just found out Redacted helped get the guns. Andrea Cook advised Io that she heard that Redacted had obtained the guns for Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold from several female students in her accounting class while they were attending Chatfield High School. She stated that she could not recall the names of these three students, the names of these students who mentioned this bits of information in front of her. She also stated that these two girls then talked about the fact that Redacted had turned himself in but added that the girls did not state to what authorities did he turn himself into. Andrea Cook advised Io that the last time she talked to Redacted was on April 20th, 1999, and that this short conversation between the two of them took place at Clement Library while the shooting and bombing incidents were taking place at Columbine High. Andrea Cook stated that she saw Redacted outside the Clement Library shortly before noon on that date. She stated that he came up to her and said, this has got to be Eric Harris, Eric Harris's doings. Redacted further told her that Eric Harris had told him that he was planning on doing something like this. Andrea Cook stated that Redacted at this time was quite angry when he was telling her this information. She further stated that he told her that he wished he had killed Eric before he did something like this. Andrea Cook advised Io that she asked him at that time why he did not tell the police the same information on this day, April 20th, with him replying he wasn't sure that it was Eric Harris who was doing this at Columbine High. She stated that Redacted then went into the library to get his sister, which is the last time she either talked to him or saw him. She further added that Redacted was steamed when he was talking to her and that he was very angry at whoever was responsible for what was taking place at Columbine High School. She stated that on April 20th, when she was talking with Redacted at Clement Library, he was wearing a tie-dye shirt with the primary colors being hot pink and yellow. Again, curiously matching the description of one of the shooters by several students. She further stated that he did not have a trench coat on at that time or in his possession. Andrea Cook further advised Io that she had not even heard of the trench coat mafia prior to this incident taking place at Columbine High. She further stated that Redacted and Eric Harris were friends, and that was the extent of her acquaintanceship with Eric Harris. She further stated that she did not know Dylan Klebold on a personal basis, and in fact did not even like him based upon the little bit that she did know of him. Wow. Okay. Wow. What a statement. No follow-up, no nothing. So we have, uh, we have Robert Perry, 
in a, a yellow pink tie-dye shirt. Several individuals have reported seeing him in this attire, including in the li in the in the cafeteria with a gun. Make of that what you will. And then, of course, Sonny Hope happened to saw Redacted walking from the direction of Columbine High School to the Clement Park Library with a tie-dye shirt as well. So, of course, we went over Kristen Long's account, uh, Kristen Long Kruger. She actually wrote a book, and it's on Amazon, Healing the Invisible Wounds of Trauma. And, of course, she's one of the few witnesses who did not backtrack on her ID and the third gunman. So here's an excerpt from this book. The truth is, I looked back and saw a third shooter who I and many others identified to law enforcement. No matter how many times I and countless others detailed the name and descriptions of that third shooter, who wasn't even supposed to be at school that day, no one believed us. One of the most traumatic aftershocks of that day was the knowledge that law enforcement ignored the warnings, ignored the signs hanging in the windows, and that countless other students who survived know that at least one other person was out for our blood that day. And it's also the language she uses is curious, at least one other person. So she's clearly aware that there were even others, even more spotted. He still roams free because the easy answer is that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were the only shooters. After all, they were dead and the weapons used were found by their bodies. Only those of us that were there that day and those who knew what was happening and who participated in the shootings or helped to orchestrate the massacre know and speak about this truth. The shooters were my friends. We were all the outcasts in that school, bullied because we didn't fit into the mold. I knew Eric and Dylan. I also knew the third shooter, which explains why I was able to clearly identify him to law enforcement. When it was all over, I realized that the person who I saw point a gun at us was not one of the two identified shooters. He wasn't even a student at Columbine anymore. He dropped out. He isn't even supposed to be here. Yet here he was, trying to kill us all. And this is Kristen Long Kruger's book, Healing the Wounds of Trauma. She refuses to backtrack, and she's clearly stating what she believes she saw. What's also curious is a lot of people reviewing this book don't even mention the third shooter. I mean, one or two do, and then they just regurgitate the, the coincidence theorist narrative that there's no evidence of a third shooter. Eyewitness testimony is evidence, especially eyewitness testimony from someone who knew all the individuals in question. So let's go back to Jennifer Small, Jen Small, which whose account we went over. But I'll do a quick recap, so document 2182 onward. So her handwritten statement is not, there's no date here or time of the statement. So I suppose it could have been day of. I looked between the tables to see what was going on. I saw a senior standing outside our classroom door. I knew he was the shooter. Then I saw an adult, blonde, short, spiky hair, thought he was in his 30s. I thought he was a cop until he held up a sawed-off shotgun. Then he and the senior tried to break into the room where a, sh a shot teacher went. So she's the one who saw the older guy with spiked hair in his 30s. When they couldn't get in, they ran away shooting down the hall once or twice. After that, they ran. I waited outside the door. I saw smoke like a smoke bomb had been lit. We stayed in the room until SWAT escorted us outside. And so follow-up document here, interview with Jennifer Small. This is document 2185. Interview April 28th by Jill Rudeler, Colorado State Patrol, approximately 315 at her residence. She had been interviewed a few days before by Pat Vanderkamp. I asked Small to go over the details of the day. She said she had seen Eric Harris at the smoker's pit between 11.05 and 11.10 on April 20th. She wasn't sure about what he was wearing, but thought he had on a trench coat. 
Miss Small said she made a remark about having a bad day to the students at the pit. Eric said something like, not only are you having a bad day, it's Hitler's birthday. Small said she remembered the remark because Harris usually didn't speak with her. She said that she thought some of the other students at the smoker's pit might have been Taryn Fleming, Brooks Brown, and Rachel Scott. I mean, that's a curiosity. That's a curiosity. April 20th. So all these individuals were at the smoker's pit just minutes before the shooting started? Let me read that again. Miss Small said that she had seen Eric Harris at the smoker's pit between 11.05 and 11.10 a.m. on April 20th. She wasn't sure about what he was wearing, but thought he had on a trench coat. Other students at the smoker's pit might have been Taryn Fleming, Brooks Brown, and Rachel Scott. Miss Small said that between 11.10 a.m. and 11.15 a.m., she saw a person who she thought was redacted, someone who hung out with Dylan, near the main doors, and it appeared that he had just come in. She later identified this person as redacted. She said he was wearing a black trench, black shirt, black and white camo pants, black and white camo pants. He normally tucks his pants into his boots, but she doesn't remember if they were tucked in or not. And he was carrying a black colored duffel bag with one or two yellow stripes or maybe just some yellow color on it. The bag appeared to be heavy by the way it was being carried upon his shoulder. Miss Small said that Redacted is about two to three inches shorter than Dylan. Okay, so out of the Trenchcoat Mafia members, who's two to three inches shorter? Is that pretty much just Joe Stare? Unless he was short, stocky. I don't think that was Brian Sargent, maybe Zach, he but Zach Heckler's 6'2", Nate Dykeman's 6'2". Just a little shorter. So pretty much Joe Stair, who's about 6'-ish, would probably be the only person that can match that out of the Trenchcoat Mafia Associates, other than the ones we don't know the heights of. Miss Small said that she went to science class with Miss Peterson, and that at 11.25 she heard a loud boom, several shots, and then the fire alarm went off. Miss Small said that Mrs. Miller, a teacher, came in and told the students to lock the door. There were two adjoining classrooms, and the next room was Mr. Sanders. At some time, she looked into the hallway, saw the trail of blood into the adjoining classroom where Mr. Sanders went after he was shot. Miss Small said that the teachers, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Friesen, Mr. Mrs. Miller, and another teacher were in the classroom with Mr. Sanders, and that the students had gathered in the adjoining classroom. Miss Small said that sometime Mr. Johnson came in, told them to flip the tables, to sort of barricade, they could hide behind. She said she peeked out between the tables and also looked out the windows of the classroom doors. She said between 11.45 a.m. and noon, she looked into the hallway and saw Dylan in the hallway with another white male. She said that he looked past the other person, he would have seen her easily. Miss Small was asked to describe Dylan and she said he was wearing a black t-shirt with writing on it. She didn't know what it said and a black hat on backwards with writing on it, and that he had long curly hair. She said that the person with Dylan appeared to be older, had short blonde hair like a buzz cut, and was wearing a white t-shirt, tight fit with no pocket, was carrying a tan colored sawed off shotgun. She said they tried to break down the door where Mr. Sanders was, and when they couldn't break down the door, they threw a bomb and ran down the hall. Around 2.55 to 3 p.m., SWAT guy came in to get them out. Okay. I read Miss Small the photo lineup admonition, showed her photo array, asked if she recognized anyone. She immediately identified photograph number one as Dylan, the person she saw outside of the science room between 11.45 and noon on April 20th, 99. I showed Miss Small another photo lineup and asked if she recognized anyone. She immediately identified the person in the photograph number three as Eric, the person she had seen in the smoker's pit, between 11.05 and 11.10 a.m. on April 20th, 99. I showed Miss Small another photo lineup, asked her if she recognized anyone. She positively identified the person in photograph number six as an associate of the Trenchcoat Mafia. She did not know their name. The person in photograph number six is Chris Morris. I showed Miss Small another photo lineup, asked if she recognized anyone. Miss Small that she believed the person number three may be the person that carried in the duffel bag. Miss Small said she didn't know his name. The person in photograph number three is redacted. So is that 
either Joe Stair or Robert Perry. During the interview, Miss Small marked on a map of the school the location of the science room that she had been in. She marked this room, Peterson Classroom. She drew a small line to depict where the tables had been set on their sides, X to mark the spot where the students hid behind the tables. In the hallway, she marked a D for where Dylan was standing when she looked out the window of the door and an E for where the other person was standing with Dylan. This was at my direction, as Miss Small does not believe that the other person was Eric. Miss Small drew an arrow to indicate which way the suspects ran after they unsuccessfully tried to break down the adjoining classroom door and then threw the bomb. So, curious follow-up here on October 13th, 99, regarding the follow-up interview that occurred on October 12th. Okay, so Jennifer, her mother, met at the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, South Substation, conducted the interview. Okay. My initial question was pertaining to Jennifer's observations where she stated she saw redacted at the high school between 11.10 and 11.15 on 4.20 and that redacted was near the main doors and appeared to be carrying a large duffel bag. Jennifer initially identifies this person as redacted, then recants and identifies redacted. So these are two different individuals, both redacted, neither Eric or Dylan. Jennifer explained that she does not know Redacted and told me that the individual she saw that day looked similar to Redacted, but she could not positively tell me who the subject was. I asked Jennifer if she was implicating Redacted as being involved in this incident. She told me she has no knowledge of him being involved in this incident and did not see him doing anything which would lead her believe that he was involved in the incident. And again, how much of this is coached? How much of this was based on her them not wanting her to make trouble, etc., etc.? We don't know any of this information. I asked Jennifer about the statement that she made between 11.45 a.m. and noon. She observed two armed gunmen in the hallway just outside her science class. Jennifer identifies Dylan Klebold as being one of the armed gunmen, describes him as wearing a black t-shirt with writing on it, had a black hat on, turned backwards with writing on it, and she saw his long curly hair extended below the baseball cap. Jennifer stated she was positive this individual was Dylan Klebold. In her statement, she then describes a second armed gunman who is unknown to her. She described the second gunman as being older had short blonde hair like a buzz cut, was wearing a white t-shirt, tight fit, no pockets, carrying a tan colored sawed off shotgun. She said the description was accurate, at which time she provided me a composite drawing that she had done in reference to the suspect she saw at the high school and provided a complete description of the suspect. Jennifer described the subject as having natural strawberry blonde hair, buzz cut, stating that the face was well-defined, high cheekbones chiseled. The party had a wide forehead and muscular neck. So that's not Eric Harris. He was 5'11 to 6 feet tall. Oval face, small upper lip, narrow nose, small eyebrows. I took the two items as evidence, later placed them in the Jeffco office evidence vault for safekeeping. I asked Jennifer if she could provide the identification of that second armed gunman. She told me she did not recognize the individual and she did not believe the party was Eric Harris. I explained to Jennifer that throughout this investigation, we relied not only on forensic evidence that was covered at the scene, but with the assistance of witness identification that the two gunmen that were in Columbine High School have been identified as Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. I like how all these investigators just lie through their teeth and completely don't mention all the, all the countless accounts we went over. Dozens and dozens of students who spotted other gunmen, identified either Chris Morris or Robert Perry as additional shooters. Uh, possibly Brian Sargent, Joe Stare. They don't mention any of that, so they just try to gaslight everybody into thinking that everybody else identified Eric and Dylan, but obviously the students talk amongst each other and they know that that's not the case. I also told Jennifer that a videotape did exist which showed two armed gunmen down in the cafeteria at the school, and I asked her if I could show her still photos of that videotape and have her determine if these two individuals she saw at the high school on the incident date. Jennifer and her mom were shown photos 44, 47, 52, 53. The still photos clearly depict Dylan Klebold, Eric Harris, as being the two armed gunmen in the school. One of the photos has the time of 11.46 a.m. This is one minute after Jennifer claims she saw them in the upper level of the school. Eric Harris is shown in the photo wearing a white colored t-shirt. Also, is that timestamp accurate? Because again, I've, I've gone over this on many other podcasts, true crime podcasts. People installing security systems, just go on all these forums, 
late 90s, early 2000s, roughly half of all CCTV security footage has the wrong timestamp on it. So can we put blind faith in the timestamp? Eric Harris is shown in the photo wearing a white colored t-shirt. He has short haircut, dark pants, and is carrying a sawed off shotgun. Jennifer looked at the photos again, and I asked her, are these the two individuals that she saw at the high school? Jennifer positively identified Dylan Klebold, but stated the other subject she saw was not Eric Harris. She told me the party she saw was 25 to 30 years old and had a thick, muscular neck and muscular build and that Eric Harris was too scrawny to be the same party she observed. I again reiterated with Jennifer that the still photos are of Eric Harris and it is the same description that she is giving us. How is it the same description? That's not even close to the same description. What the heck? They're trying to gaslight her hard. Man, let's see if she bends. Jennifer again told me she could not positively identify the second gunman as being Eric Harris and believe that the second gunman she saw was somebody other than Eric Harris. Nancy asked me how the news media had gotten copies of the cafeteria video, which was released on national news on October 12, 1999. I told Nancy I did not know how or why the video was released. Nancy said, you have custody of the tapes and you don't know how they were released. I told her I did not have that information. I wasn't privy to it. Nancy told me that it was hard for her to sit here and believe what I was telling her about the case when she has concerns if the sheriff's office is giving her truthful information. It was apparent to this investigator that Nancy and Jennifer were questioning the credibility of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. And good on them, credibility should be questioned. Nothing should be taken on blind faith. At the completion of this interview, Nancy and Jennifer then expressed their concerns, telling me that they believed their home telephone has been tapped and someone is monitoring their calls. I asked Nancy why she believes this. She told me there's a constant beeping when you're on the telephone talking and she was told several years ago that the beeping is indicative that someone has tapped your phone line. I asked Nancy who she believes tapped her phone line. She told me her scenario is that associates who are sympathetic to Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold might be responsible because these parties know that their daughter has information on the identity of the two gunmen. Jennifer also explained that since the incident date, they have received several hang-up calls at their residence telling me that the caller ID identify the calls as being out of the area. I asked Nancy and Jennifer if any of the calls were threatening in nature or if they were coming at inconvenient hours of the day. They told me that they were nothing more than hang-up calls and they have received anywhere from as many as three per day. They were instructed that if they have a legitimate concern about the phone calls and somebody making for harassing phone calls, they should count contact the sheriff's office and speak with a uniformed deputy who could ultimately initiate some type of harassment report. I also explained to them that the phone service has means of trapping those annoying phone calls and that information can be provided to law enforcement if a criminal report has been generated. Okay, so I mean, there, there's clearly some witness intimidation going on here. We'll be examining more of that later, but it's curious. She did not back down and her mother basically supported her as well. And they have included a sketch of the second gunman. I mean, it, it, I gotta say, it kind of sort of looks like Eric Harris, but again, it's impossible to, to gauge the age of this individual. But if he's super muscular, this is only his facial features, I mean, I guess it could pass for Eric Harris, but if he's a lot older, I mean, it's kind of hard to mistake a 30-year-old for a 17 or 18-year-old. But on the forum... People are actually uh, sharing screenshots from Facebook, Gen Jennifer Small's Facebook. This is from 2019, but I don't know how much earlier these Facebook shots are. And they were asking about who she saw. She says, I don't know. I thought he was an officer when I first saw him trying to calm Dylan down. I drew a picture, gave it to the police. They hide it or say it was Eric because of the haircut. The third gunman was a muscular adult not a scrawny kid. And again, the coincidence theorists all pretend that these were simple misidentifications and everything was cleared up after the investigation. Clearly, that's not true. <laughs> Clearly. They, someone asked her, did they ever find evidence? She says, there is evidence to support up to 20 people helping them that day. 
My old friends Brooks was friends with Eric and told to ditch that day. So Brooks did a lot of research on it all. He was a, a bit obsessed about proving his own innocence because of how many people blamed him. I remember going out with him and his car got egged while we were inside a gas station. Wow, that sucks. And Brooks Brown, I gotta say, out of all these parties, Brooks Brown and Eric Veek really seem to be the most emotional and possibly are the most likely to not be connected with any of this or having any kind of prior knowledge or definitive prior knowledge. Whereas all these other individuals are just appeared to be incredibly shady. Again, doesn't mean they're involved, but yeah. Someone said, what a conversation. We who aren't in Denver never heard anything else about a third person. You're in my thoughts and prayers. Jen Small said, said it was covered up. That's why I was told never to write a book. They want it to stay that way. Jennifer Small stated, thank you for kind words and prayers. In May of 1999, I wrote down every little thing I remembered from that day, minute by minute almost. There is a chance I will still write my own book. If I tell enough people about the threats I got, maybe they won't come true when I do decide to write a book. I don't want to be a martyr, but I want to find the truth by sharing what I know. A few more posts by her. The police were very mean about telling me that I didn't see what I saw. And yet they told me flat out that I was one of their most credible witnesses that day. Is that because she identified Dylan Klebold like they wanted her to? They had so much evidence to back up what I say happened to us, and their evidence said my time frames were very close, maybe a minute or two off, but I didn't see a third gunman. When you're in a traumatizing situation later, it's hard to admit when you're wrong. A Jeffco officer tried to convince me that there was no third gunman. Yeah, right. I won't be bullied to hide what I know. Someone asked her, was it staged? Jen Small responded, I don't know the whole story. All I know is that the fear, pain, and deaths were all very real for those of us who lived through it. She has another interesting comment here. Someone responding, they really hid that well in the media because the only people I ever knew of were Dylan and Eric. You're amazingly strong, Jen Small, for sharing your painful experience. She responded, the media is often controlled and inaccurate about the actual facts. I mean, more apparent now in 2021 than ever before, of course. I can't tell you how many times I watched the news or read a paper that I ended up yelling at it because I knew firsthand it didn't happen like they said that it did. They also say Dylan and Eric died almost right away, around 1215. I think the police try to say that. If that's so, who blew up the fire alarm system at 1.35 p.m.? And she actually apparently commented on YouTube as well as Jennifer Thompson. She's got some interesting comments here. This was two years ago, more than, uh, this video was Raw Cut, the Mysterious Third Shooter by the Keith Carnes YouTube channel. Posted September 27th, 2018, but this comment by Jennifer Thompson two years ago. A few comments here. Thank you for sharing some of my accounts from that day. This will forever bother me. In the years since I have spoken to a few men who claim to be former officers of Jeffco, they all said they quit because of the cover-up. They warned me not to write a book about my experience at Columbine that day. They said if I wrote a book about it, I could easily meet an unfortunate accident. That should tell you something is amiss right there. And of course, if you've listened to Mindshot Columbine episode one, the amount of people who had mysterious deaths after Columbine is just astronomical. Jennifer Thompson also made this comment just five months ago. Another survivor that saw him too wrote a book. Her name is Kristen Kruger. You could look up her book and read it. There are some random videos on YouTube and mentions of it in documentaries about why such things happen. My old friend Brooks Brown also wrote a book called No Easy Answers. I would just Google it, see what comes up. There are about 100 witnesses of the same guy, but the police talked most of them out of believing what they saw. They tried to do that with me. That's why in my part of the official report, you will see where a deputy wrote, at one point it seemed as if Jennifer and her mother questioned the credibility 
of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Because we did, and with good reason. So check out the official reports too, you'll see what I'm talking about. Another YouTube comment from Jennifer. And thank you for sharing my drawing. When they displayed all evidence for everyone to come see, they put my written description of the third gunman on top of my drawing on his face of his face so that you couldn't see the face. Also, in my part of the report, you will see that when they told me I was one of the most credible witnesses of that day, they tr also tried very hard to convince me that I saw Eric with the sawed-off shotgun, and then they reported, at one point it seemed as though Nancy and Jennifer questioned the credibility of the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Damn straight we did. They wanted to believe everything else I saw that day, but who I saw doing what. You also left out how I saw a friend of theirs bring in a heavy duffel bag minutes before the shooting. The name is redacted, but it was Robert Perry. He had a lame alibi that the police bought too. Makes me mad. I know they are out there living as if they had no part in this massacre. And just so you know, I was calm for 90% of the time I spent trapped. Others with me that day can testify to that too. I was not scared and upset. I was excited thinking we were being saved. And then I saw the gun in his hand and said, uh-oh, I guess we aren't being saved after all. The guy was trying to calm D down and held up his hands to say, I don't know. And then I saw the sawed-off shotgun in his left hand. I was one of about 100 people who saw him too. They tried their damnedest to convince all of us that we didn't see the third guy. So regarding Courtney Hallman, she said there were three guys. The guy I remember most was the main guy. He was over six feet tall, had long, turly, dark colored hair. He was wearing a trench coat. His name is Robert Perry. Hallman identified the second gunman as having a 50% chance of being Klebold. She described him as being 16 or 17 and shorter than Robert Perry, which of course is accurate, with a medium build. He was wearing a dark shirt, black trench coat. And this is... Uh, document 841. The description fits Klebold very well. If Hallman actually saw Perry and Klebold simultaneously, it would make her a critical witness. Police discounted Hallman's report because she wasn't wearing her glasses. I mean, that's, I mean, you'd still be able to tell whether there, how many guys there are and, and what heights there are, even if you can't make out exact facial features. And we did go over her account. Holman stated while standing outside the southwest corner of the cafeteria, peeking around the corner, she observed gunman number one and two standing in close proximity of each other, and that the third gunman was standing above them on the stairs. She observed what she thought was two persons with weapons and a third person with them, possibly talking to them or yelling at them. She could not tell if the third party had a weapon. You know what else is kind of crazy? What if Robert Perry or Chris Morris, what if they were there and they were trying to stop them, but they couldn't, and then later pretended that it would just be easier to, to say they weren't there? Even though, obviously, a lot of people saw them, but if they did that in exchange for immunity, that's the only way it makes sense. Because they knew that a bunch of people saw them at the school. So many people saw Chris Morris, Robert Perry, Joe Stair. They were seen at the school, regardless of whether they were involved in the shooting or not so many witnesses placed them in the school so the only way they could go on tv and do interviews and do all of this i mean would probably be if they had immunity that's the only thing that makes sense there was a report the real columbine july 14th 2000 patricia nielsen the teacher said the gunman who shot her seemed old like a man and did not look like Harris or Klebold. He was wearing a black beret. So is that Chris Morris or is that yet another individual who's wearing a black beret? Christopher Walker said he saw two males in dusters walking toward the library. Walker stated that he recognized the dusters but did not notice that either person walking was Harris or Klebold. This is page 2229. Walker knew the duo well, so it's unlikely that he wouldn't have recognized them not to mention Harris took his coat off outside. So apparently there's a CBS News report on April 19th, 2001. I can't find the actual report. A quote from the report is as followed. They, the, referring to the police, believed that they really had six to eight armed individuals inside there. 
It would be nice to narrow that report down. All I have here is it's a CBSnews.com report, April 19th, 2001. Also at 11.35 a.m., Jeffco Lieutenant Manwaring advised Vincent DiMana. Jeffco Sheriff's Office advised him there were as many as seven gunmen inside the cafeteria and the commons area. See, what happened here? Were there more gunmen initially, and then the other trench coat mafia members basically abandoned the plan? They they just left? Was there a suicide pact and they just didn't want to go through with it? They were present at the beginning of the thing? Maybe they thought it was all a big prank and that Eric and Dylan weren't really going to do it. Or Eric and Dylan were set up and there was something else afoot where they thought they were going to be part of a bigger plan and maybe they still wanted to go through with it regardless. And when the others abandoned, they didn't care because they were already either in too deep, already shooting, or they just didn't care. They wanted to carry it out. But did they believe they would have more help at the beginning? And did they, at least in the first minutes? And then the others ran away. Adam Campbell, uh, document 732, says fellow student Jessica Cave says she saw 10 shooters at the school. And there's apparently no interview for Jessica Cave. It's also curious how so many of these, some of the most damning reports uh, or interviews, they're missing from all of the released documents. Why would that be? I wonder. I wonder. Sarah Huey, sophomore, document 380, heard bombs in the cafeteria while the shooters were in the library. Josh Lapp, document 480, heard gunfire in other parts of the school while the shooters were inside the library. Brandy Wiseman, sophomore, document 4751, she was in one of the rooms near the kitchen, heard gunshots, bombs, and screaming from both the cafeteria and the library. So Dan Goins, Interview, of course, missing, but Holly Pinkham, sophomore, document 1620, says friend Don Goyne had his shoe shot off in the middle of the hall during the time gunshots were going off in the cafeteria. Matt Katzenmeyer, 3424, heard shots and explosions inside the school at the same time there are two suspects outside. Alex Babienik, 1954, he thought explosions were coming from the level he was on and from downstairs at the same time. And how does this factor into a guy on the roof who may or may not have been lobbing grenades or pipe bombs or shooting? Because if that's the case, if, if that guy was throwing stuff and it was exploding, even if there were only two other shooters, that could explain the explosions at least. Josh Brinkley, 2528, heard shots downstairs and then other shots upstairs two guns down two guns coming from upstairs one gun shooting downstairs this is document 2528 so here's his uh, summation of the shots he stated he jumped the balcony on the stairs ran up the left side people were falling as they tried to get up the stairs josh stated that he was at the top of the stairs he ran left to the science hall then out the door by the math hall he stated that he could hear more shots coming from behind him while he was going up the stairs. Josh stated that when he got to the top of the stairs, the shots seemed closer. He stated that the shots at the top of the stairs were more of a rapid fire. He stated that he could tell by the sound that there were two different guns. Again, Josh thought that there may be a shooter at the top of the stairs because the shots seemed louder and different when he got to the top. He stated that he did not feel that the noises he was hearing were explosions. He stated he did not see any shooter at the top or in the hallway while exiting. So, again, not very damning. Again, in the confusion, possibly, I don't know, bullets bouncing. It's not damning. Definitely not damning, but this one's a little bit more damning. Drew Lagerborg, 1999 document. Is that a little bit of synchronicity there? So this is curious. So supposedly Eric and Dylan were together the whole time, according to the official narrative, or just about. So, okay. This is a report titled, uh, the date here, August 4th, 99. Interview with 
Lagerborg. He was in chemistry class at the time. He heard an explosion, saw people running down the hall. S then man came into the class and said, there's gunmen in the halls, get out now. There was panic in the halls. Lagerberg said he ran down the south hall, but a gunman was at the other end of the hall. And panicked people were running back at him, so he redirected his flight through a common room to the north hallway. He then heard a shooter down that hallway as well. He never actually saw that shooter, only heard them based on the sound of the gunshots. Next, he ran to a chemistry room office where he and 15 other kids hid. They locked the doors, turned off the lights, and waited three and a half to four hours until the SWAT came and get them. Okay. While waiting in the office, someone tried the doorknobs at one point, then walked away. He has no idea who it was. And that must have been terrifying, too. I mean, that's just creepy. So multiple shooters, opposite sides of the school, at the basically simultaneously curious definitely curious jay galantine staff document 3086 sees gunman by the library then runs downstairs where he hears more gunshots all this time hearing shots all around me and above me curious Lindsay Wyant, sophomore, 4799, also heard shots in the cafeteria and the library at the same time. Evan Todd, sophomore, 8826, heard bombs in other parts of the building while Harris and Klebold were in the library. Diwata Perez and Jessica Holliday, seniors, 9923, heard gunshots elsewhere while the shooters were in the library. That's 9923. So here's the damning part of the statement here. This is actually document 9924. Both Perez and Holiday said they saw both of the suspects' face and could positively identify them. Perez and Holiday said that while Klebold and Eric were in the library, they could hear more gunshots elsewhere in the school. That's curious. That's curious. So, because their testimony, it includes all of the dialogue, them talking to each other, them reloading. So she's stating while they're in the library, so presumably not shooting, they could hear gunfire elsewhere in the school. That's curious. That is very, very curious. I think we went over Archuleta. Crystal Archuleta said she saw one person throw a pipe bomb. She told me at the time she thought it was Robert Perry before the gaslighting and re-education. Seth Dubois, Seth told Catherine Carlston that Robert Perry was seen shooting a girl in the back while leaving the library. Wade Allen Frank Sr., Mr. Frank told me that he originally thought one of the individuals shooting was someone by the name of Robert. He stated that this person was tall, approximately 6'3", and kind of awkward and gangly. And then we went over a bunch of these. Okay. The Boulder PD SWAT timeline, document 8245, at 2130 hours, two suspects believed dead inside, one arrested, one to two other suspects associates. Pam Wood's testimony is very curious, document 8902. Got call at work in pennies at Southwest Plaza from students trapped in the school. One saw six trench coats and that all were shooting handguns. Amy Terry, sophomore, was told by friend Alicia Ancinius, she was in the commons, when trench coaters with masks on came in shooting. Running upstairs, she sees four people in trench coats coming in through the glass doors at the west end of the main hallway. A poster here. When Columbine happened, I remembered hearing on the news about the additional gunmen before the falsified official story was ever solidified, specifically about gunmen wearing face masks running through the hallways. That sticks out in my memory. I strongly hold the opinion that additional gunmen were captured all over the other surveillance camera footage, and that is why the videotapes were never released to the public. Also, the surveillance footage was sent to the FBI lab in Quantico before it was even seen by Jeffco and the public. They, quote, enhanced the footage. 
Now, someone actually captured an interesting moment, timestamped 11.36.26.11 a.m. 11.36.26-11. And you can see two guys running. One of them looks like he has some kind of uh, shoulder holster, shoulder straps. Both of them look quite, especially the first guy closer to the camera, he looks a lot older. He looks like an older guy. I mean, is this, I mean, who are these individuals? I don't know. Maybe people know, and these are not shooters or anybody involved, but it's quite strange. If that first guy didn't have a shoulder holster or a harness similar to Eric Harris, it would be less curious. And then, of course, there's a lot of the video not even released, as well as the other possible cameras, all very, very suspicious, of course. There's also another crazy clip. Just come out and uh, tell me your name again. David Smith. David, you were locked up inside the science lab for hours with about 40 other students. Tell me what you guys did to pass the time. I mean, I know it was a scary time for everybody. We just talked and told jokes and just messed around. Were there teachers in there with you? Uh, not in our room, but right next door. They opened up the middle doors with three teachers and one shot laying on the ground in there. Ah, oh, that must be horrifying to see. I didn't see it, though. Tell me this. Um, you saw one of the gunmen. Tell me what you saw and what he was doing at the time. Well, first we just heard a bunch of kids running upstairs because they let off a pipe bomb, and then a kid ran in front of our door, and we were all trying to get out the door because the fire alarm went off, and he shot a teacher right there, and the teacher went back in the room, and that guy went off and ran, and we just, everybody locked their doors, and the teacher was laying there, and we just gave him our shirts to keep the blood from top, hmm. and... And so, you were in there for how many hours? Three and a half hours. We were in the room. You were in the science lab with 40 other kids. Did everybody get out and t describe to me how you got out? We were all sitting on the ground. Then they told us to lay down because the SWAT team was there. All of a sudden, the door swung open, and about a minute later, a SWAT guy came in and told us all to lay down. Then we all put our head, hands on our head and walked out. They escorted us out, Took a went in a cop car, went to the Clement, and then we all came here. Mm -hmm. And at this point, are all your friends okay? Yeah, that I know of, yeah. Um, terrifying moments was were you thinking anything um, special did you <laughs> like calling mom maybe <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't really thinking nothing till like whenever we first heard it and we all got down on the ground and then once the bomb stopped we just laughed and told jokes we knew we were gonna be all right you did did you know where the gunman was at that time there's four of them just running around the school we didn't know where they're at all right let's talk to mom and dad here if you guys could come in close and so David don't go anywhere I know yeah, they're not gonna let go in town a long time <laughs> You have been here for hours yes. waiting to be hooked up with your son. A, a terrifying thought for a parent to have to go through this. Well, you, you know, you know, the one benefit was there was nobody killed, so we knew by and large he was okay. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, I, out well, with all three dead bodies well then I, he knows more than I do at this point. Uh, I've been here. I haven't been home watching the news. So uh, now, now that I hear that, it was, it was a very trying time. It was you know, very not, frustrating. Not knowing, not, not hearing, you know, not seeing all his friends come out, you know, kid after kid after kid and then where's david nobody knows and it, it was uh it was very scary i mean list you, you after list, no no name on there our son's name wasn't there it was just so trying you know i just all we could do is cry and pray i think it's all we could do yep. how many kids go to columbine high do you know david? i'm not exactly sure i think it's around 2000, 2000. Yeah. Yeah. big yeah. school yeah it's it a huge school and I knew something was really bad. I work right up the street, and I seen the first action. I seen them block off the road. As soon as I seen them block off the road, I knew something was really bad. My first thought was a chemical spill. So I went down and tried to pass through the police lines. Of course, they wouldn't let anybody because they were still snipering. And um, so at that point, at like 11.35, I, my heart just went to my, you know, to my stomach, not knowing where my son was. Um, you know, all of his friends were okay. We seen them. No, David wasn't anywhere. They, you know. Did you know where the gunman was at that time? There's four of them just running around the school. We didn't know where they're at. There's four of them just running around the school. We didn't know where they're at. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. There's four of them just running around the school. So make of that what you will. A lot of testimonies, a lot of them don't make sense, 
I'm not going to hallucinate and pretend I know better than the people that were there and experienced this tragic event. I'm not going to pretend and hallucinate like a lot of these coincidence theories do that I knew all of these individuals in question like Robert Perry, Dylan Klebold, all these other individuals that I'm not going to pretend I knew and spoke to them almost on a daily basis and could easily identify them. I'm not going to do that. I don't pretend and hallucinate here. We don't fall for logical fallacies here on Mindshock. But hope you guys found another edition of the Mindshock podcast interesting and informative, as well as, of course, mind shocking. If you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you're allowed device to have those notifications come through. Like and share the podcast. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic logical analysis, co-podcast, or requests. Could also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire, signing off. Catch you guys 